Good evening and welcome to the December 12th, 2016 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Uh, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please call the roll? Mr. Duperry? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Ms. Oglis? Here. All right. Thank you. Next item, uh, approval of minutes from the meetings of November 7, 2016 and November 21, 2016. Second. Who made a motion? We have a motion to approve it. <laughs> we have a motion. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Item number four, Risbera Properties, LLC, requests a sketch plan review for 79 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map, R55, Lot 18. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you noted, this is a sketch plan, so uh, this is a good opportunity for the applicant to provide the board with an overview of um, as a conceptual design and for the board to provide some guidance and direction as the applicant prepares a formal application. Um, by way of background, some board members will probably remember this property as it was subject to a recent uh, zone amendment to convert the entire parcel to the TVC3 zoning designation um, ostensibly for um, the purposes of developing something of this pattern and density. Um, You'll have received staff comments, um, given some con consideration on the project. Um, principally, some of the items that we flagged were um, what would be found in our design standards uh, regarding um, multi-building developments, particularly seeking to uh, establish developments that sort of have a, a primary focal point. Um, and staff identified some, some considerations there, as well as archit architectural detailing for multifamily buildings. Um, another element that we flagged was uh, the TVC3 really seeks to um, sort of blend the public and private realm, um, if you will, in uh, considerations for uh, public amenities, sidewalks um, to and from the site, particularly a site that's going to have a relatively um, good amount of density and folks living there. Um, other items that we're flagging the staff comments uh, we're with regards to traffic management and um, uh, potential for uh, interconnected streets and sort of taking a look at the merits um, of that. Um, it was also identified, staff has heard from some downstream properties who have experienced flooding and so just as the application moves along that's something we'll want to give due consideration to. Um, sort of final elements I'll touch on are with regards to wetland impacts and, and one of the elements of the uh, definitions in our ordinance really talk about the planning board determining sort of um, uh, areas that are be considered as part, upland areas um, that are be to be considered part of a net residential calculation and just uh, be sure the board is giving some thought to the two pockets of upland that are uh, adjacent to Muzzy Road and and how those are to be considered moving forward. With that, I would turn it over to you. Thanks, Jay. And I'll hand it over to the applicant's representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. I'm here this evening with uh, Tony Pansioko, who is the principal engineer from Northeast Civil on this particular project. And also with us this evening are Rocky and Bill Risbara. So if there are any specific questions that you have uh, beyond the technical nature of things that we're looking to get into right now, I'd be willing to uh, expound a little bit to give some answers on uh, whatever those questions might be. As Jay mentioned, uh, this is only sketch plan approval, so we're certainly not looking for any votes this evening. It's just a solicitation. You know the drill. Uh, we'd love to be able to uh, entertain any comments that you have to be able to allow us to be able to move forward with this project as soon as possible. We will be back relatively soon with uh, much more detailed information. We've already worked with staff several times continue to work with staff as we typically do so that by the time we actually submit for both subdivision and site plan review, uh, you will have everything comprehensively completed and then uh, obviously we'll, we'll ask for a vote at that time and uh, solicit any additional comments or uh, questions that you may have. So what I'd like to do here in the interest of brevity 
is uh, just go through the project a bit, uh, orient you a little bit as to what's involved, and then again uh, solicit any comments that you might have. This uh, project is on Muzzy Street or Muzzy Road, which is uh, sort of the extension of Broadway coming through South Portland. Uh, it's uh, essentially between the Eight Corners intersection and uh, Gallery Boulevard or the back access to Lowe's, that area. Um, what you see here as far as the color rendition is concerned is the overall property marked out like this. The green area are the forested wetland areas. They do not have any streams coming into or out of them. It just happens to be the low forested area, but it is a classified forested wetland, uh, which basically means that it gets wet when it rains. Beyond that, there's nothing draining into or out of it other than naturally. Uh, there is also a stream. It serves more as a drainage swale, but uh, that's along this section of the property. The blue line over here. Uh, it was originally classified as a drainage swale. Basically, it doesn't have much water in it except for rain time or rainstorms. But uh, we did request that the DEP uh, have one of their uh, field inspectors come out and join our wetland scientist out on the site uh, to be able to take a look at this. We want everything to be able to be uh, considered up and in, in, uh, in front of everyone. So, and uh, she when she was out there, she did determine that uh, the DEP would like to classify that as a stream. It does have small sections of mineral-based bottom to it. Uh, which is one of the criteria toward that end, which basically means that we're looking for it. We're looking at a 75-foot setback as opposed to essentially no setback from a wetland. Uh, there are no wet direct wetlands per se that are immediately associated with this stream area. It is a channelized area, uh, which means that uh, it's got a plateau. The entire property basically is relatively flat. Uh, and we'll refer to that as the plateau, and when it comes over to the stream area, it does dip down into a channel. The point being is that when it does uh, rain heavily and it does come up with water from the Gallery Boulevard area, et cetera, then um, uh, there is some flow in there. But because of the relative steepness of the, of the channel area, uh, there are no wetlands directly associated with it. The point being is that, that the wetlands that you see highlighted here in green are the extent of wetlands on the property, which are fairly substantial. We're just not going there, uh, and I don't think anybody ever would. So. <coughs> entire area, which used to be, as Jay mentioned, used to be zoned uh, in three different types of zones. We just recently went through the rezoning process. It's now all TBC3, which allows us to do uh, somewhat with impunity what we've got relative to board actions and board approvals. So what we're proposing is approximately a 700-foot long road. In, I'll call it an internal road, as it were. It's not a road per se. It's a, sort of the driveway into uh, the overall point. We're proposing six buildings, 12 units per building a mixture of one and two bedroom apartments. The Rizbaras are quite well known for uh, construction, have been over the decades for uh, constructing uh, and managing, they're holding and managing their own units. So this is not a development where somebody is going to be building the units and then leaving. Uh, they anticipate, as they've done with many of their other units, to be able to <coughs> build these and then uh, actively manage them uh, from here on out. So. Uh, it's a, a local company that's got, uh, developing locally and is going to maintain that local flair. Uh, we propose the, uh, the parking in the buildings, as you see in the general area, uh, that you see it on your plans. We have uh, engaged Keith Smith from Terry Dewan Associates, who is going to be uh, working with some landscape architecture, uh, orientation of the building somewhat, et cetera. The site criteria is somewhat limiting. Uh, as nice of a site it is with about seven and a half acres of upland developable area uh, from the 11 acres or so overall. Uh, it's somewhat limiting because we've got that 75-foot setback from the stream, quote unquote, and then the parameters of the wetlands on the right side of the, uh, the placard as you see it. So everything is somewhat limited to the area where you see the, the pavement, which is that which is highlighted in gray, and then the buildings that we're looking at that uh, are highlighted in the gold area. As far as parking is concerned, uh, we're looking at uh, on-site parking for everyone who would ostensibly live in the apartments. We're providing parking at approximately a two-to-one, uh, which means that there would be about 140 to 144 parking spaces relative to the 72 units that we propose in the area. The buildings are laid out such that, as Jay mentioned, a little bit of uh, impact to the wetlands. We're trying to recognize or, or reconcile, I should say, and we, are by, I mean, uh, both NCS but predominantly the Resvaras, uh, this particular project with the town regulations or with the town per se and with the people who live in the immediate area. <coughs> we did have a neighborhood charrette approximately seven or eight weeks ago. Uh, everyone who was interested, uh, and these, when these invitations went out to anybody who was interested plus those within 500 feet, and uh, everybody from, uh, I believe everybody from Honan Road was there and a few others. 
we received, I wouldn't say unanimous approvals, but nobody was objecting to the project after we got done explaining what was going on. They did have a request, a sort of concerted request as a neighborhood group, and that is this particular area right here, which is a lovely open space. Um, it does actually have some medium to older growth, uh, taller pines in that area, but otherwise it's quite open, as opposed to the wetland area, which most wetland areas are. They tend to be have that jungle effect. Uh, but the area right <coughs> here is quite lovely, and we'd like to keep it that way because they would like to keep it that way. Uh, that also <coughs> is a uh, passive recreation area is a lovely place for uh, people to play and run around, kids to play and run around and what have you, do a little picnic or something to that effect. So uh, we've chosen at this point in time, pending comments from the board, to try to leave that open. The other area of uh, space, and this is obviously the stream and the setback, so we can't go in here with any type of structure whatsoever. The other area is right back in here. Uh, obviously this is going to have some uh, uh, stormwater management practices that we're going to end up having to employ on this project. And uh, because it is relatively substantial. Toward that end, we're not sure exactly how big the pond, the detention pond is going to be in that area. But when you look at something like this and say, oh, you've got some actual open space over there, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, while it's open in terms of it's not going to be built upon, there would be a structure there which is going to be the stormwater management pond. Uh, we're proposing at this point in time, even though we haven't fully engineered the site yet, to have two ponds. Uh, one is back in this area, one is right up in here. The reason for the two ponds is that it's a very linear effect, as you can see from front to back. The property does typically drop from front, meaning along Muzzy Road, toward the back, albeit slightly. Uh, the point being is that uh, it would, could be a challenge in order to try to uh, get storm water to essentially flow uphill to a pond. So toward that end, we're looking at the possibility of two smaller ponds as opposed to one larger one. That's something that we will get into more specifically when we actually start doing the stormwater modeling. Uh, but in this case, I just wanted to bring to your attention that we are proposing at this point uh, two detention ponds that would uh, attenuate the stormwater on site. Um, the, uh, the traffic, uh, we've got a, a traffic counts have already been completed. A traffic study is underway. Bill Bray is doing that for us. Uh, it's approximately 1,100 feet from our proposed entranceway to uh, the intersection of Spring Street and Muzzy Street. Uh, that's about 55 to 60 car lengths. Uh, that Spring Street, that eight corners area is a high crash site. Fortunately, while we're adding some traffic to the overall area, uh, we're quite a fair distance away from that point. Bill will obviously be dealing with, the, uh, our traffic engineer will be dealing with that, and then we'll come back to you uh, when we do come back for preliminary approvals much more specifically in terms of the, uh, the traffic report. Likewise, in the other direction, over toward Gallery Boulevard, we're looking at about 600 feet uh, from where our proposed entrance would be over to where Gallery Boulevard now exists. Our proposed entrance, as you see it here, is going into that immediately across the street from a commercial structure, which is right over in this area. That structure has uh, two access points, two points of ingress, egress, one of which is immediately adjacent or across, the, I should say, from our entrance. We are proposing a split entrance uh, two aisles out, one aisle in. Uh, that's you can see in the plan right in this area. Uh, we do plan some uh, re relatively heavy landscaping right along Muzzy Road, as Jay also mentioned in his comments. We want to make sure that this is aesthetically as, uh, as aesthetically pleasing as possible to anyone who is driving by, and certainly to those who are living there. Uh, so, in the essence of taking care of the apartment dwellers, the apartment tenants, uh, we will have as, long, as well as the aesthetic from uh, passerby. Uh, we will have a berm in this particular area and some landscaping down in that area as well, in addition to landscaping that's throughout. We obviously want to make this a, a very attractive place in which to live, and given that we're looking at market rate apartments here, this is a, a dire need in Scarborough, so we can actually provide some housing units to those who uh, work in our town but don't necessarily live here. Uh, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but uh, the firemen, the policemen, the teachers, the nurses, what have you, would like to be able to have uh, housing that they can afford. This is right in town, not too far from the middle of town, as it were here, not too far from the mall, et cetera. And uh, we believe this is a very underutilized area, and I think this would segue very nicely into it, given that we're uh, segueing into a residential area, that which is Honan Road. Uh, yet we've also got some commercial activity that's around the area. Um, as far as uh, stormwater is concerned, again, we've got, uh, we're looking at uh, the DEP having already been to the site and taking a look at the wetlands with us. and. Uh, they don't uh, have any issues as far as what we proposed for them initially. Obviously, we have not yet made any uh, formal applications to them, but we wanted to make sure that we dealt with the state uh, right up front before we even came to the board, just in case they did have any problems. 
uh, or any issues, and initial indication is that they have none. So that's, uh, that's great for us. Uh, Jay did mention that there are 25-foot uh, setbacks that are around, or any portions of the TVC3 that are around residential areas. That's essentially from this section uh, around here. Those are the only residential areas. The others are either zone business, TVC, or while this is a residential area, we don't have any intention, obviously, of going into the wetlands. Uh, so we will be maintaining that 25-foot setback and then keeping as much open space as we can. Uh, Jay also had mentioned the, the linear effect. Uh, we'd love, love to put a curvilinear road in here or many other places, but it just the site just doesn't lend itself for that. Uh, we have curved the road, albeit slightly. The point being is somebody is driving by on Muzzy Street who doesn't necessarily live there and they glance in, the line of sight would be more toward this direction as opposed to that this way. Now you'll get a glimpse, obviously, as somebody drives by down toward the end, but uh, uh, along with that, uh, that 700 foot road, but we have tried to bend it where we can. We have on a minor na note uh, to be able to take care of traffic regarding uh, postal uh, activities. We've provided a little island right down in this area where people can come in and actually drive off of the main drive and still be able to access their mailboxes from the car, keep them from their own car without even having to get out if they want to do it that way. And uh, that will keep the internal traffic patterns off the road so it doesn't block up any traffic that uh, would be going into the intersection. We are going to be uh, proposing to uh, minorly impact some wetlands. We will keep this under a Tier 1 uh, review as far as the stormwater is concerned and as far as wetlands is concerned. What you see in the light green right here is a uh, kind of a grading slash landscaped area as we come in with the road. Uh, there is a bit of the impact to the wetlands in that regard and this building here has also got a little bit of an impact. Uh, you can see from the plans that you have and from this plan that uh, these are fingers of wetlands, basically. We're not proposing to go right to the middle of a, of a significant wetland. We don't need to do that. Uh, and again, these are forested wetlands. They are not emergent. They're not coming from or going to anywhere. It's just what you see here. They were actually created uh, somewhat artificially, albeit years ago, by a, the natural berm of Muzzy Road, which is higher than the, the property immediately adjacent to it. And then Honan Road, was, these are all grandfathered, but Honan Road was built up a little bit as well. And uh, so what you see is the uh, confluence of wetlands, of rainwater, stormwater, just kind of uh, gathering in this particular area. So we don't think that there's a significant impact in this little thumb that's right up in this area. And that allows us, again, pursuant to the desires or the wishes of the people in the neighborhood to keep an area in which they would also be able to, you know, play, have the kids play, et cetera, which is someone would do that now. So we were, would be looking for specific feedback from board members toward that end uh, this evening, and that is... Uh, regarding this impact in the wetland area right up in here. Also, there is a provision in the ordinance, uh, as Jay mentioned, that uh, does say, you know, do you want to count, do you meaning the town and the planning board, do we want to count uh, isolated pockets of upland areas surrounded by wetlands? We don't have, when we've got a couple of them right in this area, two smalls here, a small one right here. Uh, we would like to be able to utilize those in our overall calculations. Uh, we don't have any intention of going there. They are barely upland areas, but they are. They're little islands onto themselves. Uh, and by including them in there, we can get everything that we're looking at now uh, with the proposal that we have before you. So with that, I'm sure there's a, a few more things that uh, you may have some questions. Uh, I'd like to be able to entertain all of those. Any comments toward this end, specifically asking you for the feedback about the, the impact to the wetlands and the utilization of, this, of these two uh, small wetland or upland areas surrounded by the wetlands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Susan, would you like to start? <laughs> okay, what I'd like to do is just go down through um, the staff comments with things that I have highlighted as being important to me. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what it is you're looking for us to do with what is um, apartment number six. Um, in other words, my opinion is if that it's, I don't see why we have to have it there. In other words, it's one building. Mm -hmm. It's right in the, it's, it, it does use up wetland. Um, it encroaches upon the use of it as the Honan Drive. People have indicated they would like to have that area be available. Um, but on the other hand, I also understand that it's a development and we want to get as many as we possibly can out of the property that's there. So I don't have any way of solving that issue. I mean, personally, 
And if you didn't have it there, you could also bend the road a little more, maybe. Uh, thank you. I take it. Yeah, that's just. I also would like to um, put in a vote for as much landscaping. You said you are very attuned to that, and I would like, I, I assume, because you always do provide good landscaping, but in this particular one, it would be very important because of the fact that it is such a long um, road, and it's right on Muzzy Road, so uh, thank goodness the berm is there, but you know, I will personally be very interested in the landscaping there. Um, all right, let's see. The visual quality, you know, that first building, I'm sure the buildings are all going to be pretty much designed to be the same. That is correct. But let's assume that <coughs> this first one is going to be like right there. So it's going to set the theme. So when we get around to the, the design standards of the building, something other than just a box would be, would be nice. Um, traffic management, uh, no, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, I think that what is on the staff comments under site design says it better than I could, which is that the architectural details, and I, again, I'm thinking of that first building, and if you're going to do it, do make this effort, that's the one that's going to be seen the most. But the design standards, you know, the, the structural detailing and finishes, it will create a sense of identity and continuity while avoiding uniformity. Now, that's a challenge, but I think it can be done. And especially in something that is, you know, I don't want it to look like cookie cutters. Sure. So that probably is quite my way of putting it. Um, I'm not too concerned about what's going to be happening with the traffic because I'm sure that it, by by just where it is, it's going to have to be you know, really looked at deeply and I'll be looking forward to the results of that. Um, and the downstream flooding is something that obviously we look at very, very closely. I have a question and that may be answered by staff. Under the feedback on um, other considerations, the number one paragraph says, in determining the net residential acreage, one of the items to be considered are areas that are isolated and unavailable. Is that what you mean by the um, uplands? Yes, these areas right here. And you would Upland like areas, but they are isolated. And that they're I'm, I'm sorry, Susan, I can't really hear you too well. No, I'm sorry. Usually I get told that I'm too close <laughs> to the microphones. I'm not used to sitting down at this end of the table. Um, I'm not sure what we have to say about that. I mean, it, I don't understand exactly how that net res works when it comes to uplands. I mean, we can't say don't use it, can we? So the standard is, when you look at the definitions of net residential calculation, the standard is that the planning board determines areas that are determined isolated and unavailable for, for development. So that was staff's question to oh. the board. Okay. Because it, it is a board decision. All right. So the question is about those upland pockets. Is that an area? And sort of um, in past applications, sort of the, the, the litmus test the board has used, are, are they areas that one would reasonably expect the developer to be able to sort of right. get? Okay. All right. I got You're it. happy then? It seems very clear to me per, as one member of the board that those are not, they're not usable. So. But we don't intend to use them. No, no, I'm just saying the yield. And use them. Yeah, meets the litmus test. Yeah, the litmus test. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, geez, what's going on here? The parking. That's a lot of parking. It is, um, and I'd like to address that. Actually, Please. thank you for bringing that up. Um, the, the standard, typically, the standards of every community recently, in the past ten years or so, has sort of been the opposite of what it was before. Then, you know, provide extensive parking for everybody so that there's no issue. No, that extended uh, impervious surface area out a little bit considerably greater than it needed to be in some cases. So the whole pension recently has been to try to contract that a little bit. Uh, obviously we've seen what the requirements are as far as the staff is concerned, as far as the town is concerned. Um, fortunately the Resbaras as developers of note of uh, projects very similar to these throughout the, the greater Portland area also have practical experience as far as parking is concerned. And the determination has really been that when you've got apartments, uh, the one and two bedroom apartments, in today's world, most people, most couples tend to have two cars. So what has happened in the past 
is that uh, people have a dearth of parking when there's limited parking available uh, in a particular project area and somebody literally drives up and down and they end up being you know, six buildings away or whatever it might be from where they live because that's the f closest parking area that they can find. It's not to say that something like that wouldn't happen here as well, but what we've done through experience is to provide two spaces uh, per each individual unit. That brings us up basically the double amount of parking to, to the units that we've got. That's the rationale. If the town decides that they want to have fewer parking spaces, then obviously, you know, to be able to get the approvals, we'll do what you require. Uh, but our experience has been that we really need those spaces. Not more than that, but we do need the, the two per unit if possible. It's a difficult issue, especially in an area, I mean, I keep coming back to this, but it's one great big long line. Building, parking, building, parking, building, parking, building, parking. And then the parking is large. You know, this is not ideal. If it's one of those things, however, we also don't want people, you know, without a place to put their cars. So if we need that much parking, I would request that we look at landscaping. One of the things to their credit, that, thank you, uh, and one of the things to the Respire's credit is that uh, they have been known <coughs> uh, quite well for landscaping because that, when, when you go into any development area, it's obviously easy to go into the field or whatever it might be and just build up apartments and roads and whatever it may be and call it good and leave. In this particular case, obviously, we don't want to do that. Um, so as probably many of us are aware, just given the fact that the Rizbars have been developing in, in and around Scarborough for uh, many decades, is they like to be able to make their units, not just the aesthetics of the buildings, but the site as well, uh, very pleasing to anybody, obviously, those who are going to li live there and those who would be coming for, as visitors and driving by. The point I'm making is that uh, they have absolutely no qualms about landscaping. Uh, and that we will obviously produce a, a full landscaping plan for you. And uh, that's what um, Keith Smith is going to be doing for us. But uh, yes, Susan, I hear you. And I've heard Any that chance in the past. I get to use that word, right? <laughs> but so. um, this, this, is a, this is an area where, you know, sometimes I, I'm a little, I'm, I, I'm able to back off. But on this one, I will definitely be looking for some rather outstanding sure. landscaping. And then lastly, I'm very interested in. Um, staff suggestion that the hammerhead that extends into the subject property should be clarified, but also the, making this easement at the end of Honan Road part of the public right of way. I, I saw that. I didn't actually get a chance to speak with Jay about that. I'm, I'm not sure what the difference would be. Scarborough as a town holds a perpetual easement to that area. Uh, we, this is the area that we're talking about. Yes, right. Um, and, uh, and the Honan Road, which eventually at one point stopped essentially here. Mm -hmm was extended because the bus goes down, the school bus goes down there, um, did, does, whatever. Uh, so the, uh, the requested of the, uh, the current owner who uh, granted that years and years ago, that uh, perpetual easement. Um, I need to, to, we need to speak about that a little bit more. Um, Scarborough has full rights to it right now to do whatever they wish. I'm not sure of the benefit to turn that into a public road. Can we just talk to him? Um, it is paved. I'm just asking. Steph. I would actually ask Angela to speak to that. I think okay. she's probably yeah. in a better position than I am. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but at this point, we have um, the right of way when it stops, and just to clear that up. And if we have the opportunity with this in front of the board, it's an opportunity to, to get that in fee. So it becomes part of the town right of way rather than an easement. And, and I haven't researched it to see what that easement says and, and what rights or things like that. But obviously, if you're talking about an easement on a property as opposed to we own that property, obviously there's some differences there. And so it's something that, yeah, we can look into. But it would just look like an opportunity to clear up that right of way where as it's not usable land for the developer at this time you have a road there, um, and so that might be, that, that's all that came up during a co my conversation with Public Works. Okay, duly noted. I mean, we can certainly take a look at that, and uh, if there's no issues, I don't think there would be any issues, and mm -hmm. take a look, but thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to the rest of the board. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Roger? Uh, thanks. <coughs> um, sticking with Hone and Road for a second, uh, when you had your charrette, um, was there any sentiment on the part of the residents to have a connection to this road? Oh, yes. Oh, so they they're, preferred they're amenable to that? No. no. Oh, no. They're not. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, there, there were sentiments expressed. Uh, <laughs> uh, they but, uh, and they were very, very nice about everything. There was no issues with the proposed development. 
uh, as far as anybody being against it, but there was some adamant requests, I'll leave it at that, amongst the members to not connect uh, with the unit that we're proposing. That's not, as Jay mentioned in his staff units, that's not really that unusual. When you have somebody that lives at, or people that live at the end of a dead end road, unless you're going down, unless you live there or going down there as a guest, nobody goes there. And I think the, the, the pension of the people in that area was to try to keep it that way. Sure. Uh, no issues with the development. Kids can go back and forth and be a little bike trail or whatever, but as far as vehicles are concerned, they specifically requested that we not go there. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask about uh, sidewalks. Uh, did you have any plans to have a sidewalk at least going over towards the gallery? No. <laughs> We're planning on that. I did note Jay's comments. Um, that's about 600 feet, yeah. and uh, you know anything is possible. It might be a little bit of a challenge given the drainage swales that are within the right of way, and then we don't have any. There are several properties in between us and the on both sides of the road, between Gallery and uh, Gallery Boulevard, and where we're proposing to come out. So it's not likely to go on private property. Uh, again, anything is possible, and we can certainly take a look at that. But uh, the literal answer to your question is no. We haven't really looked into that yet. Uh -huh. certainly will. I was, Jay, I was trying to uh, recall when we were talking about the Asian Fusion restaurant, mm -hmm. didn't we have a discussion about sidewalks right along that stretch there? We did, um, and I'm trying to recall how that one was resolved. I think the challenge was on that side of the street, for a certain extent, there's a, there's a bigger ditch line that I think was trickier to work with. So I think it's part of their application. Um, we might have looked at securing a sidewalk easement along their frontage. Um, I think what that might have been the way we resolved it. There's no sidewalk in front of those commercial properties right there. Is You're talking about across the street yeah, where, so um, correct, mm -hmm. there's, okay. that's sort of where the ditch line begins. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So it's a ditch being All right. there. Um, the, uh, I, I understand the, um, your limitations in terms of because of the wetlands and the, and the the stream and everything, so you can't do much about that. Um, and I, I assume the uh, the units are going to look very similar to the ones you built over in Westbrook, which I think were attractive. Uh, <laughs> um, and I guess if it's if we can do it, I have no problem with that upland area um, factoring that in because I don't see any anything being developed there. So. Um, at this point, I guess I don't have any other questions. Thanks. Dick? Yeah. I uh, Just <clears throat> piggybacking on the upland area, have we calculated what the impact is to the development, whether it's included or not included in your calculations? Is it, what, what does it equate to? Does it mean uh, one less unit? Does it mean two less, you know, what is what does that upland area mean to you in the grand scheme of things here? Um, it's fairly significant. If I understand your question, you're asking if, if we didn't go there, if we didn't do any impacts, then it, it doesn't equate to a unit. I mean, these buildings can't be built with portions or fractions of units. Uh, they're really constructed with uh, 12 units per building. The point being is that if, if we drop below a certain percentage threshold, the equivalent of a half a unit, we end up losing an entire building. Uh, in order to be able to, and I know business economics is not a, a, a great uh, identifier as far as uh, approvals are concerned regarding town standards, but every project obviously has to be economically beneficial or otherwise it doesn't work anywhere, no matter what kind of project it is from a private house to a, a subdivision to a commercial entity. In this case, the pro forma, and you can see that we could actually get more buildings in here, uh, but we haven't proposed them at this time, uh, primarily because we want the math to be able to work and still be able to do whatever we can or as much as we can with the town relative to being sensitive to the people that are around the area. So I think the long answer to your question is, if we did not go into that area with, uh, we've identified it as building six, if we didn't have any wetlands impact, that entire building would go away, would disappear, and suddenly the viability of the project becomes much more substantially in question. Are you asking actually, Nick, about the net res calculation? Yeah. And I think that's what that was a question as well about that particular unit, but I think, not to speak for you, but yeah, I, I think that's where I was going what you're really it. asking yeah, is, it. yeah. okay, if you so take that out of the, if you take that, those upland, those isolated upland uh, pieces oh. out of the net res calculation, how does that impact the project? 
Well, anything that we lose as far as upland area is going to, I'll say, negatively affect the project in terms of losing any of the units that are there, uh, which is why we included them to begin with. If we didn't need them, we wouldn't have, well, we would have shown them, but we wouldn't have not have needed them in our calculations. Uh, given what we looked at for the rest of the site, they're small, they're substantially small, but they're not tiny. And given that, we wanted to be able to include them, knowing full well we have no intention of going there ever. Uh, but we would like to be able to have them there. Again, the long answer to your question is from a net residential standpoint, we really need those areas to be able to allow us to have the units that we've got. Okay. It looks like it's, what, 0 0.21 acres, roughly? Are those uh, three, three don't know that off the top of my head, but that sounds about right. That's what I got, yeah. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those, those are significant, the amount of buildings slash units you can put into this spot. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, you know, I personally would have liked to see building six somewhere else. Um, and I think you had some opportunities there, and I understand that you have some reasonings for wanting your detention pond where uh, on the northern side of the property here where it's located. Um, I assume you went through a ton of iterations to get this configured the way you wanted it yes, to. Yes, quite a number. If you could just highlight for me again why you, you you chose not to put that sixth building somewhere in that upper area and trying to work a maybe that detention pond down into a different part of the parcel. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so what I'm going to address is why we've got the layout this way as opposed to the other way the more consideration you can go through. Uh, and because of the slope, from, albeit a general slope, but a, a downgrade from this point to this point, uh, the stormwater, the natural flow of stormwater from about this section uh, toward this end, and then from about here, everything else basically flows down in this direction. So, uh, putting a pond anywhere than other than, or a stormwater management device, I should say, which in this case will be a pond, uh, in any area other than at the furthest point away, becomes a significant challenge to get water to go there, not as naturally as possible. As engineers, we like to think we can make water flow uphill, but it gets a little bit of a challenge to do that. So we take natural advantage of the terrain that we've got to be able to locate a pond, particularly in this area. Now, the size of this pond is still in question. Keep in mind, looking at the size of the wetlands, we know we've got a relatively high water table in this area. Uh, plus, it's over an aquifer area, as Jay has already mentioned, uh, which doesn't mean anything as far as the development is. That means a lot, but as far as the development is concerned, there's no issue as far as that is in that regard. But because you can see that the wetlands are very slow draining in this area, we've got soils such that if we're going to be sending stormwater to a particular pond, we'd love to be able to have it be all sand, you know, the six inches of loam that you find out in Iowa, but it doesn't work that way in Maine, where you can send, you know, stormwater into a small desk size unit and it'll just keep on sieving right to the bottom. In Maine, soils aren't like that. So what we're looking at, and we will have much more specific information for you when we make an official application, uh, we're presuming that the pond is going to be relatively shallow and fairly good size in order to be able to take the amount of stormwater that we're going to have sending into it. One of the things, as a quick aside, that you <coughs> mentioned earlier about the, the flooding in the, down, in the downstream areas, the nice thing about both uh, state and local regulations is that uh, we have to treat 95% of stormwater uh, from any impervious surface in a post-construction scenario relative to pre-construction. What that means essentially is the treatment of this entire area, because the pond is located down here, is actually going to substantially help with flooding issues downstream, or flooding issues that come from this stream, as it were, uh, because anything that comes that now flows off of this site eventually works itself to this stream. Well, we're now going to be attenuating that on the site uh, before and retaining that stormwater to allow a, a much slower percolation rate. The point being is that when we have these 50-year storm events with one heck of a lot of water in a 24-hour period and it falls and it goes wherever it happens to go, now we're going to be taking that water and directing it to these ponds. So instead of flowing automatically in here and, and acting as a gusher further downstream, we're actually going to be managing that stormwater and retreating it uh, for both quality and quantity, and we're going to be slowing down that volume. So the, CF, the uh, cubic feet per second flow of the stormwater is going to be substantially more managed than it is now. So the, the flooding issue should be less. Not hugely less because this is only a micro watershed compared to everything, but it is going to be less downstream than it is right now. Uh, and again, to answer your question, 
proposed funds in the this area. We're presuming at this point the fund is going to be relatively sizable, which means that we don't want to come to the board and say we're going to put a building right there instead of a small pond and then come back to you with the official uh, application and say, well, we can't really do that because the pond has to go at its lowest point. It's got to be a bigger pond. We're making that assumption right now. And then if it turns out to be not quite so much when we run those numbers specifically, then obviously we're going to shrink the pond, and then there's a few other possibilities that we may have at that point. So are you saying that you actually would consider moving a building over there if you find that the detention pond could fit alongside in the vicinity of another building? Sure, if it fits and if it works in terms of its gravity flow, then yes, absolutely. We'd be open to anything toward that end. Okay. Um, this is the... Uh, a very minor detail. Are you demoing the shed that's on the property as well, or is that remaining? Small shed that seems to be indicated by your second detention pond. I imagine it's from the existing single family home. Oh, this right here? Yeah, that's not part of your plans, right? That's oh, actually, it is. That's a little dumpster is. area. Um, okay. And that will be tweaked to the point where we fit within that, uh, that setback. Actually, it's not in the setback right now, but uh, that's one of the dumpsters at, at the end of the, uh, uh, the parking area. The other one's right. Everything that's there right now, there's a, a small farmhouse, as it were, old farmhouse with a shed that is on it right now. Those will be coming down. And then um, as I'll just comment, and I think um, it's smart of you to include the number of parking spaces um, of the calculations you have them, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a residential area, um, based on my experience working in some of these facilities. Uh, residential parking for liv livable units is always a, so. In this situation, the more <coughs> more is better, um, most often than not, uh, because otherwise you do run into a problem with where do you put excess cars, especially in a location like this. So, <coughs> all I have right now. Thanks, okay. Nick. Robin. Yeah, I'd like for the record. I'd just like to um, say that I agree wholeheartedly with my uh, colleagues regarding. Uh, first, the moving of Building 6, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Two, uh, the, the need for the robust bus landscaping. Um, three, uh, not to make this cookie cutter. Four, that uh, perhaps we can think about some parking alternatives. And five, um, to capture the hammerhead um, ownership versus easement. And last but not least, six, um, that sidewalks would be very much encouraged in the, or you know thought of as, as very important in this area. So I'd like to get back to um, the, the comment that you had about moving the building number six down in there because it would infringe upon the stormwater detention pond uh, size. Um, I, I'd just like to, I guess, caution you in, in, in um, I guess, removing or replacing too much of the forested wetland in that the forested wetland is actually doing you a huge amount of favors mm -hmm. by capturing both the stormwater quantity and quality there. So the more you the more you remove of that, the more you're going to have to treat or attenuate, as you mentioned, before the stormwater does leave the site. So it's kind of uh, a, 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 you know, sort of like a... a sort of a juggling act. Yes, it's very much a juggling act. So I would I would challenge you to think about if you were not to impact the forested wetland right there, what that would give to, give to you as far as your pre-construction flows and, and um, in, in the modeling kind of a thing. Because I, I really feel like um, that, that's giving you a lot of attenuation right there kind of a thing. The other thing, Jim, I would like to encourage you to do or challenge you to do is think about not only just, well, first of all, is the, do you envision the stormwater flow down the street as it goes down the road to be uh, subsurface or on the surface kind of a thing? So will there be catch basins and underground pipes, or will it just flow in a swale on the side of the road? Which will it be? Uh, we haven't decided that yet. We've looked okay. at both possibilities. So what I would challenge you to do then is to really think outside the box and maybe treat the stormwater locally as it goes down the street with really pretty rain gardens or bioswales or something like that because mm -hmm. then that will also help you to reduce the size of your stormwater pond or the need to make a very large stormwater pond either at the end of the street or in addition to the street. One of the other comments I have is um, along the back side of the buildings it looks like you have a where the current forest line is, the tree line is back there. Is there a tree line behind the buildings right now? Yes. 
how much of that will be impacted because that will also help you attenuate the stormwater before it runs off your property. Sure, almost none of it. We're, we're trying to leave as much as, of much the tree as possible. Line there. Oh, that's fantastic news. So that's that's really really great news. I was wondering if you can um, also talk to me about the uh, tier one threshold. What's the what's the threshold before you go from tier one to tier two, Jim? Is that where you're at right now? Yes. Okay. So we're going, it's 15,000 square feet. Okay. Um, of impact, and we are going to be in a, well, I'll stand here this evening and say to the greatest extent feasible, I think 95% of it is that we're going to stay within a, a tier one, okay. under a tier one. And so what does that 9,000 <coughs> square feet of, you know, because I added it up also like Nick did to get 0.21 acres, that's about 9,000 square feet of uh, upland area. So how will that also um, work into whether or not you hit or not hit the tier one versus tier two permit sure. requirements? Um, it all works together. Obviously, we have to make the mathematics work. Uh, the reason I say, and anything is possible, and we could jump to a tier two as well, but we don't want to do that. Um, it's more predominantly because once you hit that threshold, then uh, it becomes a much more extensive type of permit, and we just don't need, we don't feel we need to go there. If it looked like we were going to trigger 20,000 square feet of impacted area, then we would be there anyway, and we wouldn't even have, be having this mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, but in this particular regard, uh, we are striving to keep um, all that impact to less than 15,000 square feet. Okay, and you've talked about that with DEP yeah. already. Yep. What watershed are you in? The name? Um, do you know the watershed? Say again? None such. Okay. Um, what are you planning to do about the aquifer protection overlay district and zoning requirements and standards there? Um, we've taken a look at it. It doesn't look like there's going to be any substantial impact from what we're looking at. Obviously, we have to adhere to all, in all um, strictures of the, uh, the aquifer protection area, and we don't see that there's going to be any problem as far as we're concerned. Okay. I can get into more specifics, but we okay. just don't. We, we try to avoid or minimize any of those impacts, and in this okay. case, I think we can avoid it completely. I'm just going to defer to Jay. Um, what, what generally does, could you just refresh my memory, what the aquifer protection overlay district um, standards generally require, Jay? Um, sure, um, and I think for this project, given the scope of it, it probably doesn't have much impact as was just stated. Okay. What it requires is for any project in the aquifer protection is to um, uh, to meet Chapter 500, a certain threshold of Chapter 500 rules, okay. which I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. But given the scope of their project, they're going to be triggering that review process anyway. Got it. Um, so there are okay. some other more minor details regarding fuel tanks, you know, mm -hmm. maybe having double wall fuel tanks or where lines are able to go, but that's really more on the construction side of Perfect. things. So. Do you, have you thought about um, the fueling yet, whether it will be propane perhaps and not a, not a liquid petroleum product? Natural, Natural gas. gas, right on, excellent. Um, okay, just from an aquifer protection standpoint, I, you know, it has nothing to do with the fact that my husband works in that industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, I would also echo staff comments regarding low impact development techniques, which is sort of what we'd already talked about, treating... Rain gardens. Yes, or something like exactly. Um, we talked about the tree line. We talked about the 75... Oh, I didn't quite talk about the 75 foot setback there, but it looks like you don't really need to worry about that too much, Jim, since it's behind in a tree line kind right. of thing. On the drawings, that, is it included on the drawings here, the 75 foot? It is. There yeah. it is, the dotted line. Okay. Good. I think I think I'm done. I think it's a great project. Thanks, Robin. Yeah. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah. Um, my colleagues have done a wonderful job with uh, most of the things I had ticked off as we've been along. Uh, I I too have a concern about building six, um, and I, I think you've heard from from folks that that's uh, pretty general concern that they have. I have an additional one that's not been mentioned, and it's just, um, I guess, something to throw out there, that to me, as I look at this, you have a series of six buildings that are essentially isolated from each other. And for young families and folks moving in, it, to me, it would be important that there be a sense of community developed. And I don't really see any sort of community 
gathering place, land, um, benches, park area, some place where the kids can meet or the, the mothers can meet with their kids. Uh, I know you had talked about keeping that uh, land in back of the old growth forest in back of building six as a place for the, for the kids, but as you develop a landscaping plan, I would just really like to see something there and, and to see some attention paid to developing community. We can certainly do that. Our intent is to, is to keep the open spaces as natural as possible, but we can certainly direct people or encourage people to take advantage of something by, by augmenting it a little bit, to be sure. Thank you. Thanks. Rick, I think you guys covered everything. I'm good. All right, good. Going toward the end does have its advantages. Yeah. Some of these items. <laughs> I had like three questions right across from all Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During sketch plan, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I appreciate the overview and, and your attention to the staff comments and kind of walking us through things and helping us understand the context and some of the constraints, uh, including what has compelled that sort of linear design um, based on the wetlands and the stream there. I'm glad you were able to get that all delineated and kind of defined. Um, as, as some of my fellow board members said, I, uh, I also um, have some concerns about uh, lot number six, uh, given the just the configuration and the presence of the wetlands. And I know that, you know, it's in one sense, not all wetlands are created equal, but still, still, still wet. wetland. Um, we generally don't like to see uh, wetlands on private property. I know we get into a little bit of a gray area here because we're talking about apartments, and I think one of the things that we're usually thinking about when we talk about that rule of thumb. We're generally thinking more about single-family homes and the fact that they turn over over time, and <coughs> people very quickly lose sight of what the, you know, what the constraints are there and what the resources we need to be mindful of. So I guess in that respect, um, I might be inclined to think about that a little bit differently. I, I still do have my concerns, though, and I um, hope that you'll have the opportunity to continue to look at that and, and maybe explore some different scenarios as you get your stormwater analysis back and some of the other due diligence that you're doing just to see if there are any other opportunities to um, to reconfigure that given the project economics. Likewise, um, on the upland, uh, those isolated upland pockets, um, I don't know that it wasn't necessarily uh, unanimous on the board, and I know there's at least one board member who said he was fine with it. Um, I have a hard time sort of passing the straight face test on, on, on those types of pockets given how isolated they really are um, and that I understand you're not going to go there but I think even just sort of working through the logic of, of that test, that hypothetical test, um, I just have a hard time getting my head around giving credit for that. Um, so I hope you can continue to look at you know, the sensitivity testing that I'm sure has been ongoing and looking at what, um, you know, whether you could have a viable project if that was not factored in. Um, I'm not saying that uh, <coughs> unilaterally taking those out, but that's my personal opinion as one, as one board member and we're at sketch review level and hopefully there, again, will be more opportunity to continue to look at that and work with staff on that and, and work with your own team. Um, I look forward to seeing, again, the, the, uh, the stormwater analysis as well as the traffic study. Um, <coughs> as, as with my fellow board members, um, definitely look forward to seeing a robust landscaping plan. And um, I, I thought Rachel's point about having some kind of uh, somewhat active versus passive recreation area or gathering place, even if it's just benches or something like that, would be a, a great thing to consider. I know there are always a lot of factors there when you're thinking about that with any kind of multifamily development. We've got maybe concerns about creating an attractive nuisance and you also just have limited space with which to work, but I think if you can think that through, that would be a nice thing to consider. Um, I want to make sure I've hit all the points here. Oh, on the parking, I, I appreciate that explanation. I think you know we do generally, as you said, as a lot of towns and planning boards have been doing in recent years, usually look for opportunities to reduce parking and reduce those impervious areas, but I think given the nature of this development, I 
think, and based on the the applicant's past experience, I think the additional or the higher level of parking seems justified. Um, and I also, just to close the loop on the other item, I would join my fellow board members in sort of endorsing the idea of the of uh, kind of taking things to the next level with the hammerhead there and the, the easement. So hopefully that's something you can continue to look at. Um, beyond that, I think we've pretty well covered everything and hopefully given you some good Absolutely. thought and homework and hopefully we'll see you back fairly soon. Thank you. Do you have anything else for us? I think we're all set. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. Item number five, Clifford and Sherry Colville, Ronald and Monica Bellew, George and Denise Gardner request a seconded amendment sub amended subdivision plan for Nunsuch Cove subdivision, Nunsuch Cove Road, Assessor's Map, U12, lots 26, 27, and 27D. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this application is before you, as you just noted, for the second amendment of the Nunsuch Cove subdivision. Essentially what the applicant is looking to do, at least with the split of lots 22A and 22B, is to codify essentially what's been in existence for nearly 30 years. Um, the lots have been functionally separated per building permits that were issued and ownership. Um, and it was identified recently that they were still functionally one lot on the recorded plan. Um, I'm sure the uh, applicant or the representative can give you a little more detail than that. Um, but I will just note that the lots do, fortunately, meet the R2 standards, so they are compliant with the underlying zoning or the zoning of the area. Um, and outside of that, staff has very little comment, and essentially from staff's perspective, this is a fairly administrative item, but um, okay. we will defer to the board on that as always. Thank you. And if the applicant or their representative has a brief uh, word to say, go ahead. Uh, my name is Matthew Eck from Sebago Technics, and I'm here to represent the owners of these three lots. Um, Mr. Bolio is, is here this evening as well if you have any questions directly for the owners. Um, but basically he purchased um, lot 22, which were these two lots, um, 29 years ago. And um, when he was going for a building permit, discussed it with the code enforcement, it was able to split the lot in two, so he built his home here, sold this lot, which the home was built the same year. Um, then the neighbor, being lot 21, uh, built their home and built it a little too close to the property line. Um, so Mr. Bilio uh, conveyed this triangle to the neighbor so that they would meet setbacks. Um, the lot split originally and that triangular lot um, conveyance from one lot to the other um, did not receive <coughs> planning board uh, approval or did not go before the board at all um, back there 28 years ago. So basically we are now just trying to uh, approve what was done 28 years ago uh, so to clear title on the properties. Okay. Thank you. Um, we do, for the record, have the opportunity for any public comment. If anyone would like to get up and speak on this, seems pretty straightforward, but give that opportunity. All right. Seeing none. Anyone on the board have any questions or concerns about this? No? Okay. I don't either. <laughs> it is straightforward. Yay. So Jay is fortunate that things kind of worked out the way they did. Um, with that, I'll uh, put a motion forward. I move to approve the second amended subdivision plan of Nunsuch Cove as presented on behalf of the property owners by Sebago Technics. Second. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, number six, Chiropractic Family Wellness Center requests a site plan amendment for 433 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map, U37, Lot 11. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this application is before the board for a pretty discreet request for a site plan amendment. Um, the applicants have built the Family Wellness Center at the intersection of Route 1 and Royal Ridge Road. 
And when they developed that property, the one element that uh, staff noticed when we did our sort of final inspection for certificate occupancy was that the um, sort of stone veneer that was supposed to be along the base of the building was not there. And so we uh, uh, secured a performance guarantee for the, that work. Um, the applicants are now before the board to amend their original approval um, and to eliminate that element from their architecture uh, design. Um, so extensively what the board is asked to look at are sort of the design standards of the town and staff pointed out that sort of the provisions that are prevailing would be the general architectural, uh, yep, general ar architectural principle and facade design elements or provisions, I should say, of the design standards. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Chair. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Meg Pickering, and I'm here with my business partner, Dr. Carol Coyle. We're the owners of the building. And when we, we built it two and a half years ago, and we were on a time crunch. That's why we didn't get the stone veneer, which was supposed to go on the front of the building. Um, so we supplied the performance guarantee, and there's been a few things that have happened as we have lived in the building, one of which is that um, we didn't have enough dirt. <laughs> it was a parking lot, and so we had to pull up all of our landscaping, put in three feet of loam <coughs> so that our the landscaping that we had put in could live. Um, so, And as one of the pictures, there's an architect's rendering in the packet that I supplied to you, which shows the as the shrubbery grows in, the stone face doesn't even show. So that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we don't feel that or we're hoping that you will approve this amendment application. And we do feel, as I, I noted several in the application, um, we feel that the building does meet the design standards. It's a very attractive building. We're really proud of it. And as you drive down Route 1, you can see that it really is an inviting building. And I think it really enhances Route 1 for Scarborough. And we get a lot of really good positive feedback about the building. It's been nominated for different design awards. So any questions? Thank you. Um, before we go to the board, uh, any public comment on this? <coughs> uh, I'll just note uh, quickly, briefly, that um, there was some discussion with staff initially when this first came forward about just having this potentially approved as an administrative process, uh, just through the chair. But I thought that given that this was something that was part of a past board approval, it would be appropriate to give the whole board an opportunity to look at it. Uh, I personally think it's, you know, fairly straightforward. I don't particularly have any have any particular concerns, but um, to bring it to the board. Is it? Um, thank you for doing that. And I think it's important because we are very fond of our design standards. And um, if you hadn't brought it here and I had found that it just happened, I would say, excuse me, you just tell them they didn't have to live up to our design standards. But I agree with you. Thank you for bringing it to us, and I don't see that this is an issue. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Robin? I would just like to commend the doctors for putting together a very straightforward package. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we do understand that circumstances change and things come up, and we appreciate that you for the, went to the effort to put this together and, and come before us. Um, and I agree that the building looks great, and I think you've made a good case that to go back and put the stone veneer on it would really be sort of unnecessary. So um, with that, you have a motion. motion somewhere. I will move to approve the application of Dr. Pinkering and Dr. Coyle for the site plan amendment of property at 433 U.S. Route 1. The board finds that the existing building's architecture, architectural elements and design will meet the design standard requirements without the addition of the previously approved stone veneer at the base of the structure. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Moving right along. 
Item number seven, Dunstan Properties, LLC, requests a site plan review for Table and Tap Restaurant, Fessers Map, U30, Lot 16. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, board members will note this item has been before you a few times. Uh, part has um, first as sort of the broader overall Dunstan Village master planning process, and then more recently as part of the more refined and detailed analysis of the restaurant itself. Um, so um, the applicant has been privy to a host of staff comments and board comments to which their most recent application is aimed at addressing. Um, as board members will note, last time they were uh, before you, there were uh, some remaining comments regarding traffic and traffic <laughs> impacts and how it fit in with the overall subdivision to which um, staff fields have been largely addressed. Um, there was also some comments with regards to the buffering to the abutting property owner that uh, board members also will have note uh, largely have been addressed. A um, couple of elements um, that still are outstanding. One, um, the most recent application uh, really highlighted a mechanical, mechanical pad um, that wasn't quite as evident with the uh, prior submissions um, that's on the south side of the building. And there is a um, screening with that, but I think the detailing of that screening is certainly something that the board will want to pay careful attention to. Um, there is also uh, a little bit of uh, remaining uh, spillover on a from lighting, I should say, on a budding residential property. Um, that um, something to continue to be addressed. And then I guess the other element that had been talked about at previous um, reviews have been dealt with stormwater and how that fit in with the overall design. So maybe Angela, I'll turn it over to her to give the board a little update on what's happened with that. And then uh, that'll be me. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been going back and forth with the design engineers, Svego Technics, and um, I, I think they've done a great amount of work to get to this point. We're talking about doing um, some groundwater recharge system on this site, and this is really a template for the other site plan applications to come for Dunstan Village. So that's where we kind of really wanted to get into, I guess, the nitty gritty and the details of this because it's really setting the tone for the rest of the development out there. And um, Sebago's worked great with me back and forth to get us there, um, and we're talking about really treating locally. This isn't water quality per se, but it's um, really addressing the, the heart of the concern for Phillips Brook, which is our urban impaired stream that this discharges <coughs> to, which is more related to <coughs> volume and velocity leaving the site. So um, I think working together to come up with this compromise and a way to address the specific concerns of this watershed, um, I think is, has um, helped on both sides, I guess, of this. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll hand it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Emery. I'm a main licensed landscape architect with Foresight Architects uh, here this evening uh, with Elliot Chamberlain, Sean Frank, and um, Mark Burns, uh, the architect and principal of Foresight Architects. I'll go over quickly. There weren't too many issues uh, with respect to the site. With respect to the uh, spillover, with the site lighting, uh, we do have a photometric plan prepared by Sweeney Lighting, uh, and we've looked at using, uh, we have a colonial style or a decorative fixture that we're using along all the walkways and uh, in front of all of the buildings. And then around the perimeter of the parking lots, we've introduced more of a traditional area light, which is called, it's a Kim Warp 9. Uh, it's a very sort of sophisticated design. Uh, but anywhere, uh, because we don't have particularly tall uh, poles, uh, even in the parking lots, are only 12 feet. Uh, what Sweeney uh, has suggested, because they have difficulty uh, sort of micro, um, not, I guess micromanaging would be the, the term, but uh, to use shutters or some masking in areas where there's uh, light spillover, and those were identified in our previous uh, submittal. Uh, there was a, a part in the uh, back right of the site. And uh, with respect to the area of the parking lot uh, on the southwesterly corner of the site uh, and the additional buffering, we've removed those 
uh, parking spaces from the plan uh, and uh, kept the rest of the parking as required 25 feet away from that uh, property line. Uh, with respect to the uh, screening of the mechanical equipment, uh, as typical with most projects, the mechanical design comes late in the process and oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, before the planning process, planning board review process really gets completed. Uh, but we do have the equipment uh, now uh, identified uh, for the building and uh, we're proposing <coughs> a six foot high screen fence. It would be a decorative fence, either wood, if it's wood, it would be uh, white cedar or uh, PVC, uh, the, the post would be PVC reinforced uh, cellular, cellular PVC and that's a very high quality uh, product used by some of the best gazebo and fence manufacturers in, in New England. And the six foot height along with trees along uh, the street that runs in front of the um, enclosure uh, will help to screen it and uh, to the side we have some uh, evergreens, uh, primarily uh, arborvitae. Uh, there's not enough room between the fence and the sidewalk to provide any additional screening between the fence and the sidewalk. Um, so with that, uh, I guess if there are oh, questions, I'll turn it over to Sean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sean Frank with Sebago Technics. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, piggyback onto Angela's uh, comments. Uh, we certainly appreciate the time of staff. As everyone knows, obviously this is a site within a, a much larger project um, that's going through DEP, DOT, as well as the town, and obviously the coordination associated with that, and certainly appreciate town staff working with us on that. Um, it, accordingly, we're, we're pretty much at the point where we are submitting for the overall subdivision in association with the next phase of the Dunstan Crossing subdivision as well as the overall development of the, uh, of the village itself in terms of the overall stormwater management plan uh, and the traffic associated with that. So uh, as you may recall, our initial thoughts here was to allow us at least to uh, um, get the site plan approval so we could finalize the, uh, the financing associated with that, perhaps even get some dirt moving out there if we could. Um, uh, as we started this whole process. So uh, again, we certainly appreciate the board and, and staff working our way through it. Uh, we do have the staff comments in front of us. Uh, hopefully Tom's addressed most of those. Um, one of them was an additional sewer manhole. I did discuss that with the sanitary district uh, and we will need to add that. So I will get that on the plans. Uh, talk to Angela about maybe a, another field inlet or so uh, for the uh, uh, for the under drain system. Um, and the final thing I believe was um, um, uh, was the traffic as associated and as we did discuss the fact was that we do have some approved trips uh, from phases five and six of the Dunstan Crossing subdivision that obviously hasn't been constructed and won't be constructed until everything's worked out from a traffic standpoint uh, but uh, worked with the uh, staff again in terms of uh, allowing us to utilize those trips while still paying the, um, uh, the traffic impact fee. Uh, the final things I think was some actual capacity letters from the sanitary district and the water district uh, which are forthcoming. Obviously they'd like to have pretty good designs associated with that. Uh, so um, you know I have a meeting with the water district tomorrow. Again had a discussion with the sanitary district today so uh, we are there with them. Uh, so again a staff, I mean if the board is comfortable uh, with a conditional approval in terms of addressing these final uh, review comments with, uh, with staff, I uh, <coughs> certainly appreciate it. And again we'll certainly be back in front of this board uh, hopefully at the next planning board meeting to discuss uh, the overall project. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you. Is that it for your team? Great. Thanks. Um, Robin, do you have anything? Um, I would just like to thank the team for, for working with the town of Scarborough to provide um, some, some really important uh, attenuation mechanisms like the roof roof line, drip trenches and the like, it's really, really important. I know it's um, not something that you necessarily had to do, but it, it's really the right thing to do and I really want to commend the applicant for doing that and get going. We want a restaurant. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Yes. Rachel or Rick? Okay. I uh, just quickly want to clarify um, staff's um, concern regarding the mechanical equipment enclosure. Mm -hmm. Was it just the identification of the materials that were to be used or was it more or less the design they're proposing? No, it was, it was um, I think the comment or the detail on the sheet talks about being either cedar fencing, which is 
makes sense. And then I think the, it talks about or PVC. And again, I think you know PVC can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So just being sure that we're really and I, I'm, I have a high level of confidence they're thinking about a high quality uh, material. But that's certainly something we just want to be sure is. Yeah, that that will be a white vinyl. Yeah. Higher end white vinyl fence around that uh, enclosure. I guess would it be similar to the materials that are being discussed? Because I think uh, the trim on the restaurant, if I'm not mistaken, is sort of that higher quality PVC. You're right. The, the trim on the restaurant is the yep. style of PVC. Yep. Um, but you've seen, you know, the white vinyl. You've seen that uh, people's yards around uh, commercial properties. Uh, and yes, there are different grades of it, and and we've used all forms of it, and, and it all comes down to the, the, the highest quality is always the best one to use. I mean, this is going to be here a long time, and this is going to be seen uh, by quite a few people the way this is exposed as you're driving down the street, so we want uh, as much as anybody for that to be attractive and long-lasting. Okay. And then uh, just one last clarifying thing on these windows. Oh, did I steal your thunder? No, just please, I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, it does say opaque windows, and it is going to be the best attempt to make it look like a real functioning window, correct? W which windows in the building are you the talking top, about? The top uh, the dormer windows. The dormer windows. The dormer windows. Well, windows. <laughs> those are strictly exterior visuals. They'll be, they'll be blackened out. You won't be able to see the, the roof system from outside. Um, so you'll see the it will be a real window, but there'll be uh, probably blacking, blackened out plywood on the back side of those. Okay. Um, do we know? I I don't think I've ever personally seen it. Maybe I haven't. I didn't notice it. A blackened out window. Mm. What does that look like? You just can't see right or a film. You just can't see. If we were to do nothing, you'd literally either see the plywood sheathing on the roof behind it, or even worse, you'd be able to look right into the roof system itself, which is certainly not what we want. Is it akin to having a regular window on a house that has the lights off in the room? Yes. Thank you. Yep. I'm all done. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Roger? Um, I'm, I'm pretty well all set. I, I think they've answered most of our questions we've had, and I think you've done a nice job. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Susan? <laughs> I'm very, I'm very, I'm not sure about these windows. <laughs> it's because, I'll tell you where it's coming from. <clears throat> it's coming from the um, Walgreens drugstore and all those windows that aren't windows. That aren't windows. Yeah. If, if they're going to no. give me a sense of that here, I'm going to be a very unhappy no. camper. We've, we've done this on residential home many times where people are looking for something visually attractive to break up a, a large roof system, mm -hmm. but there's there's nothing up there, strictly right. an attic. So this will be a real window. I could, this window uh, below and the yep. windows in the dormers are the same windows. So it I, is a, it, it is a you, real window. I think it's when you said black that I went. Mm. Uh. No, literally we, we take a sheet of plywood, put it about six inches behind the window and we black, we paint it black so you can't, you're not looking at a sheet of plywood or. <sighs> I am not going to make a big deal about this, but with staff somehow would check on that. <laughs> I, I will. I will note. I think the question was um, not sure where where you've seen it before, and you yeah. maybe haven't noticed it. Uh, if memory serves me, I believe the McDonald's right down here on Route One mm -hmm. has a few uh, second-story <coughs> windows that are smaller, but they they are darkened. I will drive by uh, immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope memory is serving me correct on that. Right, we'll invite you down as we're building the building just to get your approval. <laughs> yeah, come and pick me up and bring me down. Um, having said that, I want to say something really nice to the architect. I love it when you come in front of us with your, with your um, landscaping. It's absolutely wonderful. And he's going to put in a ginkgo. <laughs> That's very exciting to me. <laughs> I do have to say to staff that I had to read this. I know, I'm old with my magnifying glass, and I only did it because I knew he was doing it. It was going to be worth the effort, so this is going to make it all okay. Thank you for an excellent <coughs> plan. Um, I just want to cover a couple of things that were on the staff um, review comments. The um, mm, construction schedule that you mentioned, that, mm -hmm. that, that has been worked out, or it will be worked out? But well, to give you a, the short version, uh, 
right now we're looking at starting phase uh, four, the connection from Route 1 back over to where uh, phase two currently ends on Waldron Drive okay. uh, within the next 30 days. Uh, we would expect to start this foundation probably not until probably February, uh, once the winter breaks. Um, this winter. We're looking at probably an opening of late summer. Uh, we're looking at paving phase four probably uh, in the May range right after the uh, paving plants reopen. Okay. And for what it's worth, um, I think that's a fairly administrative item at this point that staff are comfortable with and we have a condition of approval if the board is so inclined. That's what I'm looking inclined. for. I haven't uh, read the prepared. condition of approval. That's good. Okay. Um, okay, that's been taken care of. That's been taken care of. I think that everything, oh. No. I don't want to make anything up. I have to. I think I'm all set. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Another restaurant in Scarborough. Uh, thanks, Susan. And um, yeah, I'm, I think I mentioned it last time too. I'm not wild about the dormer windows, but I understand where you're coming from, and I understand the approach. And I'm not going to make an issue of it either. Um, I'm, you obviously have a vested interest in making it look as good as possible, so I'm sure you will. <coughs> um, I wanted to, I, I think in general, I'm, I'm uh, with the rest of the board and being happy with how this has all turned out. I appreciate um, the way your team worked with, with everyone on stormwater and everything else. Um, I'd like to thank staff too for, for working with you and working with us to sort of break this piece out, if you will, um, so that you could move forward with the restaurant while still kind of maintaining the integrity of the rest of the, the phasing. And I think you'll see, um, you get to a draft motion that we have here, there's some language in there that kind of alludes to that a little bit. Um, but, you know, this has been, sometimes these, these big projects can be a little bit overwhelming and, and I'm, I think it's a good thing we were able to kind of take out a discrete piece and not take it out, but sort of focus on it and, and to be able to advance that and, and still protect the the, the overall phasing for the rest of the right, no, You know, and, yeah. and that's, and I, I think everybody knows there's a lot of behind the scenes work on every project. I think this one, there was uh, quite a bit more than usual. And I think with the help of Jay and the help of Angela, uh, DEP and Sean and Rick, and there was a lot of moving parts to this. And, you know, I think everybody working together as well as they did uh, was able to make this come out the way it did. So great. we appreciate that opportunity. Yeah. Um, also, uh, just a quick note on screening the mechanicals. That's something that can sometimes, as, as your architect mentioned, can sometimes come along late in a project and, and in our experience, I think have uh, a disproportionately significant impact on the visual um, impact of a, of a project and sometimes is almost an afterthought. And so I'm glad we were able to focus on that and that you were able to incorporate that screening into it. Um, so it doesn't end up being sort of the tail wagging the dog. Um, <coughs> with that, I would like to put a draft motion forward. I think everything else has been pretty well covered. Um, I move to approve the application of Dunstan Properties LLC, represented by Sebago Technics and Foresight Architects under Chapter 405 Zoning Ordinance and Chapter 405B Site Plan Review Ordinance with the following findings and conditions. Uh, findings as stated here, uh, be in the record, I won't read it all. Uh, the conditions, number one, at the applicant's request, the traffic generated from the restaurant use is superseding the traffic generated from a portion of the undeveloped residential capacity of the approved Dunstan Crossing subdivision. Therefore, prior to the start of any activity on phase five and or six of the Dunstan Crossing subdivision, an updated traffic analysis is to be reviewed and approved by the town and DOT. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Dunstan Corner, $22,432. <coughs> Igus Parkway, $10,890. Oak Hill, $4,350 for a total of $37,852. Number three, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide a revised construction phasing plan, which clearly delineates the scope of work associated with <coughs> restaurant approval 
and identifies what elements within the Stewart Drive right-of-way are to be completed prior to occupying the restaurant to be reviewed and approved by planning department staff. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, building permit, the plan set is to be revised to address the staff comments related to field inlets, mechanical pad and closure materials, manhole location, and light. And number five, a pre-construction meeting is required before the start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and his contractor, and utility company representatives, if applicable. Pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with the senior planner. That is the motion. Second. The second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Item number eight, three East Grand LLC requests a site plan review for three East Grand Avenue, assessor's map U22, lot 123. Okay. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, as board members may recall, this application was on the board's November 26th, uh, sorry, November 21st agenda. Um, at which time it was tabled uh, because there was a, a number of items that were sort of incomplete or needed further refinement um, before board consideration. Um, that enabled the applicant to provide um, a uh, revised submission to the board with a point-by-point uh, -point response to staff comments which uh, <coughs> was able to address many of our prior issues and comments. Um, We'll note that in reviewing this item, I think one of the, the main elements for the board to weigh in on is the uh, proposal for off-street or off-site, I should say, parking. Um, the applicant has modified the restaurant to a 72-seat restaurant um, with some mixed-use retail and a dwelling unit, um, as we talked about at sketch plan. Um, so they're proposing to have 20 spaces on land directly abutting their property, which is actually DOT land, which they have a license agreement for. And then they have another 20 parking spaces at, at an off-site um, property about uh, 1,000 or, or more feet away, which I'm sure the applicant can, will provide more details on. So essentially what the ordinance allows is for commercial sites to utilize off-site parking, provide the board finds that it is reasonable. Um, so that will be part of the board's charge tonight. Um, in looking at that. Um, I do want to note that at sketch plan we had, there was quite a bit of discussion around a couple of legal questions regarding the use of the DOT land for um, a parking as well as the dwelling unit for J1 employee housing. The applicant's uh, attorney provided an opinion on those matters and the town's attorney reviewed that and agreed with the assessment that the license agreement does give the applicant the proper right to an interest to move forward with the application, recognizing that if that license is ever terminated, then the operation will will be out of, uh, cease to be in compliance with their site plan and will have to stop operation until such time as they get any further approvals. Um, and then in terms of the J1 employee housing in the dwelling, um, again, it's a, it's a grandfather dwelling unit in the um, in the building and it can continue to be used as such, and, and that was found, found to be consistent um, by both the applicant's attorney and, as I said, reviewed by staff, um, town attorney. So I just wanted to be sure that those issues were brought back to the fore for the board because those were um, pretty prevailing at the time of sketch. Um, let's see, another item that the board will want to at least <coughs> weigh in on is uh, the TVC. I should, uh, if I haven't mentioned, this property is in the TVC4 and the Shoreland Zoning Overlay District. TVC4 has a standard that all parking, uh, when, it come, when, an app, when a site plan comes before the board, all parking is to be found to be to the side or rear of a building in the TVC4 unless the board finds uh, there's really no reasonable practical alternative. Um, and if you do, then you can provide a waiver for that. So I think, uh, again, that's something the board uh, will want to just weigh in and in on as part of your uh, review. Um, 
sort of have a host of other sort of staff comments here for board members to go through. Do just want to also identify that in addition to staff comments, you will have received um, comments from Goral Palmer, who did a traffic uh, peer review of the traffic report uh, on the town's behalf, as well as from Woodard and Curran, um, who did a uh, peer review of the civil engineering. And then um, board members have received a number of um, uh, public comment letters, and we've been providing those to you. And just wanted to make note there was one that came in today that we weren't able to get you, to you electronically. Um, and you do have a hard copy before you. Um, so uh, at this point, Mr. Chair, I think I'd turn it back to you. And as always, staff is here to answer questions as we go. All right. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Tim Fisher with Northeast Civil. This evening representing uh, Sue and Vin Clough, who are here with us. Also uh, with us uh, are uh, their uh, legal representatives, uh, Peggy McGeehee and Joe uh, their astounding architect who has uh, worked wonders with this uh, otherwise <coughs> interesting building that's there currently. Uh, Tony Pansioko is here to, from NCS to answer any technical engineering questions that you may have. And Bill Bray is here uh, to address any uh, issues as far as traffic is concerned. The reason we have kind of loaded the docket this evening, and we didn't mean to actually do it that way, but um, Sue and Vin have been working on this project for the better part of a year. Uh, more particularly uh, and more specifically over the course of the last six months or so, uh, attempting to turn what is uh, it's a service station. I mean, let's call it what it is. It's been there for decades. Uh, the Conroys have been running it very effectively for that period of time, and they are ready <coughs> and have been ready to leave for a while. Uh, it's a very challenging site, as it were. It's a relatively small site. It's about two-thirds of an acre. It's taken up predominantly by the existing building that's already there. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot of room for much. Fortunately, Peggy was able to work her magic as far as the, uh, the licensing agreement with the Department of Transportation, which took a little while to, uh, to work through, but the DOT was quite good toward that end in the end and said, yes, absolutely, we've got a licensed agreement, uh, which allows us not only to be able to put parking, but signage and basically essentially use the DOT land uh, that I'll point out here in just a moment uh, for our benefit. Uh, that was obviously key. We've been working with and have had several meetings with staff uh, again, this isn't a large project in terms of geography or in terms of size or configuration, but it is a bit challenging given where it is and uh, what's been going on there and what we'd like to do with it. So toward that end, we've had a lot of these meetings and we've tried to hash out a lot. The huge benefit of not being here last time was that we did have the advantage of, J of, of the town's comments. We were able to address them as well as the peer review comments uh, to the point where those that you have before you right now are not much. Uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to address those as well. But uh, before we go into that, I'd like you to take you through a quick orientation and then we'll go from there and certainly open it up to comment. Uh, before I begin that, I would like to say that we are under some constraints. Uh, we would like to be able to receive uh, final approvals or approvals this evening uh, with condition. I'm sure there will be some, to be sure. And I'll even bring up one or two. We will be asking, as Jay addressed the, uh, the waiver issue regarding the parking, we'll be asking that uh, for that as a waiver. Uh, but it is absolutely integral for us to be able to move forward so that uh, <coughs> Sue and Vin can begin substantial work on the project to be open ostensibly uh, this late spring, which they would like to open then for the season. This is obviously a seasonal business. It will remain so. Uh, for those of us who know Pine Point, there's not a whole lot of activity that happens down there in the off season, the off season basically being around the end of October through the winter time until almost the end of spring. Uh, hours of operation before I get into the orientation, uh, orientation here uh, are, are geared to be um, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, that's when serving will continue. There may be a few people that would uh, uh, stay around a little bit after 9 p.m., but by 10 p.m. typically it would be closed as far as the restaurant is concerned. As far as uh, days of operation or specific dates, we're looking essentially at April 1st to the end of October, uh, and that is the extent of the seasonal operation. One of the comments, as a quick aside, by the, uh, the traffic reviewing engineer was, how are you going to deal with the snow? Well, fortunately, we don't have to deal with the snow other than keeping an aisle clear for emergency vehicles because we don't intend to be in operation past the end of October, and we're not intending to open up again until early April, so the snow should not be a factor. Uh, if it is, I'll, I'll, I'll just touch bases on that really quickly, and then we'll come back to the orientation, but the snow is actually going to be stored right in this particular area, meaning that we can use the existing parking lot. We don't have to push it beyond that. 
Having said that, let's get into the orientation here a little bit. We know where this property is, right at the intersection of <coughs> Grand and Pine Point, right where everything kind of happens at a very uniquely configured intersection. That intersection, as we understand it, is going to be reconfigured relatively shortly. Uh, there's also already some work uh, that is um, scheduled by the town uh, to complete uh, a renovation of Pine Point from the bridge uh, over near the Snow Scannery all the way down to this intersection. Uh, that's part of the, the beginning, as it were, of uh, reworking a lot of Pine Point. Notwithstanding the fact that it's not exactly a gateway to Scarborough, the restaurant that we're proposing is literally going to be in a very visible area. Uh, so it's very important that we've been dealing with landscaping and with the aesthetic appeal of the building. What's really fortunate for us is that the building is sizable enough to the extent that it is going to house or plan proposing to house their restaurant and two small gift shops. We are not planning to change the building configuration at all. There will be an aesthetic facade change, obviously, but the building itself will remain as is. Uh, likewise with the property. We are not proposing to change anything on the property other than to make it better than it was. When I say the property, that also includes the DOT lease area. That, by way of orientation, is this gray section right in here. That's this line that comes down to the corner of the building, comes straight out to uh, uh, East Grand and then down East Grand. So this section right in here is actually DOT land that they have granted us in a license. Uh, so again, for orientation, we've got a building right now that has got impervious surface in this entire section. Uh, it's parking lot. It has been forever. When the DOT it didn't originally, uh, it wasn't originally DOT land. The DOT took it when it was reworking that uh, intersection uh, with proper compensation at the time. Haven't really used it to the extent of this area, to the extent that they recognized they didn't really need it. So getting the license was uh, not a challenge. But uh, again, Peggy and Joe worked their their magic on that one, and we have all that <coughs> set, as Jay had mentioned. We're actually improving the site as far as stormwater is concerned and impervious surface area. We're reducing it all, uh, which basically means that right now we've got a preponderance of impervious surface area and it's all, it's all the way across the front. It's all pavement. Uh, we're getting rid of all of that. Notwithstanding a small patio that's going to be here, the rest of it's going to be uh, ripped up and, and re-landscaped, uh, or landscaped, I should say. It hasn't been landscaped at all. So this entire area of greenery down in this section and then over here you'll see we'll have uh, considerable landscaping in it uh, relative to what's there now, which is essentially nothing. Uh, and again, the building is going to stay the same. The J1s, uh, who are their employees, who will be working in the restaurant as well as the Bailey Lobster Pound, that's the area with the dock that's out front, for those of us who are, may not be aware of Pine Point. Uh, the J1s will be staying in the quarters up above, and as Jay had mentioned, uh, both uh, the uh, Sue and Vin's attorneys and the town's attorney have taken a look at that and blessed off on that, so that is not an issue. So what we're looking to do is to create a restaurant in this particular area. We've got a, a proposed gift shop over here and a proposed gift shop over here. The restaurant will entertain <coughs> 72 seats, a combination of literally table seats and bar stool seats with also offering, planning to offer some uh, seats that are going to be outside on the patio area, which is this section that's right out here. Uh, as far as parking is concerned, we're going to be encouraging people to be able to come into the restaurant to be able to park where they will. There are going to be 20 spaces, including two handicap spaces, de specifically dedicated handicap spaces in that particular <coughs> area. In order to be able to accommodate uh, all of the municipalities uh, requirements for parking based on the J or the housing situation, the gift shops, uh, the standing room only in a lobby while people are waiting to get seated, the actual seats themselves, et cetera. Uh, we've got that 72 seat <coughs> restaurant and we would like to be able to have and do have 20 additional spaces that are now located by a lease, a signed lease that you have or the town has uh, at the Snow's Cannery area. Uh, that area is already being improved in conjunction with this project. For those of us who may cruise down uh, <coughs> Pine Point Road every once in a while, uh, if you look, you come over the bridge, you look off to the right, there forever and a day has been uh, an old bus and some trailers and, and what have you parked right alongside the road. They are being removed. That's where we're going to be putting our parking. It's approximately 1,200 feet away. Uh, as far as uh, that parking is concerned, any parking that is utilized by employees, although that's absolutely minimal because the J1 employees do not have cars, uh, they specifically are, are, are not allowed to have them. Uh, so there won't be a whole lot of parking toward that end, but uh, anything that is affi directly affiliated as far as employees with the restaurant are concerned will be parking in that area. That frees up the, the uh, preponderance, in fact, all of this area for patrons. Uh, for the other patrons uh, who are looking for places to park, 
We have signage uh, that is a part of your packet uh, in an area that's right here uh, that points to additional parking uh, with a, an arrow for, for the uh, restaurant with an arrow pointing down toward Snow Canning Road. We have a sign <coughs> at Snow Canning Road stating additional parking for the restaurant and then right in the parking area within that in Snow Canning Road area that uh, says, okay, here's your parking. It's a little overkill, but <coughs> make sure that everybody or no one who has not been there yet will, will uh, have any questions about where to park to be able to, uh, uh, to walk back down to the restaurant. One of the interesting things in the dynamic about all of Pine Point is it's obviously a summer community. There's quite a number of people who live there year-round, but the preponderance of people are really active in the summertime. Uh, Sue and Vin have been operating their, uh, the lobster uh, restaurant there for quite a long time, their father, mm -hmm. Sue's father before them. And uh, suffice it to say, they've got a lot of experience in the area. The reason I bring this up and that it's very important is that a huge portion of their clientele or their patrons walk there from Pine Point. Uh, anybody who's coming from this area obviously is going to be driving or biking or what have you, but most of the people that are in that area, many of the people walk to the uh, Lobster Pound restaurant right now. Those who don't walk, many of them bike, and then a few of them pull up there with their cars. We have that experience over decades, and we know that that's going to work quite well. We don't need a waiver as far as parking is concerned. We were initially thinking about doing one, but we don't need that right now. We may come back to the board here about that because uh, a little bit of the dynamic has changed as far as an acquisition of this property here uh, that we're, that's not in the equation as far as the, uh, this evening is concerned. The point I'm making with walking and biking, however, is that we're providing a bike rack, a fairly extensive one right down in this area, and then for you know, encouraging and the people who walk there, there are going to be a fair number of patrons who will come into there, we expect to come into the restaurant, who won't be having vehicles at all. So the need for parking is, if not minimized, it's certainly diminished beyond what we would have to pr uh, provide if we were out in the middle of nowhere and we were drawing, uh, drawing all our patrons from elsewhere. So we believe that a, a great portion of these people will be walking and biking, but we've provided parking for the amount of number of seats that is in the restaurant and the gift shops anyway. Uh, so I would like to ask the board for some special consideration toward that end that they recognize that Snow Canning Road, uh, which is 1,200 feet away, uh, is not that far of a walk uh, to be able to get down there. And we don't think we're going to need a whole lot of those spaces anyway. Anybody who perhaps sees you know, over 1,000 feet of walking may end up driving and who comes in here and sees the place is full may end up driving back to their respective homes and that are a couple hundred feet away or whatever and walking back to the restaurant anyway. We don't know that. Hence, we're not asking for these specific waivers, but we believe that to be the case. The point being is that I think there's going to be no issue as far as the number of parking spaces that we have uh, available for the seating in the restaurant. <coughs> as you've noticed in your packet, there are we've, we've tried to do a couple of things for you. We've addressed the comments that uh, came in from uh, the reviewing engineer and staff last time, and uh, we've also then, when we submitted or resubmitted, there's a very couple of thin sheets of uh, a couple of additional comments that staff had. You'll notice that the, uh, the reviewing engineer comments uh, were exact. I'm going to skip to those just for a moment. Uh, they are absolutely minimal. In fact, that there's really only one issue here uh, of note, and that is uh, an existing dry well into which some of the storm water on the site ends up flowing. The area down in that area, Pine Point, uh, unlike the previous project that we were discussing, it's all sand. Uh, so it's very easy for the percolation down there. Uh, the point being is that the drywall was installed uh, about a decade or so ago in conjunction with some new subgrade sewer lines uh, right around this area. The drywall is right back here. And it's got a huge concrete cap on it. So we weren't, it takes a backhoe to open it. So we were not able to open it. We stated that. The reviewing engineer concurred that just when you are, are doing your work, please just open it. The equipment will be on site to do that. If it needs to be cleaned out from sands and silts and what have you, it certainly will be but it's provided uh, no problems or it's caused no problems in the decade or so that it's been there uh, so far with taking the stormwater from the site and pumping it through that dry well. That is a point that we will take a look at. That's essentially the only comment that the reviewing engineer had. Uh, jumping to the traffic reviewing engineer, you'll see that uh, uh, Bill Bray has uh, significant or has put in a, his uh, traffic report. It's been reviewed by the independent traffic reviewing engineer for Town of Scarborough. And if you read down that list, it essentially says we concur, we concur, we concur. Um, so knowing Bill, there are no issues toward that end, but if you do have any questions as far as traffic is concerned, he is here this evening to be able to address those. Uh, back to staff comments. I'd like to just kind of run down this list a little bit and then uh, open it for you uh, to be able to ask any specific questions. The DOT lease and the J1s we've taken care of. Uh, the, uh, the J has commented that uh, if either of these agreements, is section two, if either of these agreements should be terminated, 
uh, the site will be out of compliance, we will put that onto the, the plan. Uh, that will be a condition of approval, or we would ask that be a conditional approval this evening, and then obviously we'll work with staff to show that that is a comment that's on the plan. Talking about flood proofing, not something that the, that the planning board really has to worry about, but uh, other than to say that we've worked with, Brian, with the uh, codes officer and uh, we've discussed that with him, it's fairly minimal. There's only a very small section of the building right in this corner that actually is in the floodplain. Uh, the building actually preceded the designation of the floodplain, that's how old the building is. But uh, nevertheless, there's a small area that does come up to the corner of the building. We'll put a membrane there. Uh, we've talked to Brian about that, and that's not an issue. So as far as the flood proofing is concerned, we, we, it's in our own best interest to address that, and we certainly will. Uh, site access, there's no particular issue. Internal vehicle circulation, staff has no questions. As far as parking is concerned, that again is what we would like to, uh, to request the board officially for a waiver. As you can see, this uh, lot has two fronts and two sides, essentially, as opposed to the typical front, rear, and two sides. Uh, so this also constitutes a front. There's nowhere else to park, anywhere. So uh, as soon as it's because the building is oriented this way, addressed this way, this is where the predominance of landscaping is going to be, a nice little porch out here. Uh, this isn't really a front, but officially it is, so that's where you need to have our parking. So one of the questions we'll have at the end of this presentation is to request a formal waiver of the board uh, for being able to allow us to put parking where, we, where you see it. Pedestrian ways and uh, space and alternative uh, transportation. Jay had a comment, or the town had a comment about um, uh, the town is going to be redoing uh, Pine Point all the way down to essentially this point right here uh, coming up this coming year. This sidewalk area right down in here is, there is a sidewalk there. It's not bad, but it's not great. Uh, Subgrade materials are fine, but the, uh, the surface has been cracked. It's been there for decades, et cetera. And uh, in conjunction with the tearing up the rest of the pavement that's already in this area, replacing it with the patio, uh, we can resurface that sidewalk. That should not be any issues whatsoever. Landscaping and buffering, you've got a landscaping plan that is quite detailed. I'll let you comment on that if you wish, Susan. Um, as far as uh, <coughs> stormwater management is concerned, uh, we're taking care of everything on site. We're actually making this better than it was, again, by adding landscaped area, meaning vegetated area where none exists today. Uh, we have, there was a DEP permit that is permit by rule, simple permit by rule that is required uh, for the uh, impact for this entrance right up here. We already have that. Uh, that was issued quite a while ago, and you have that, and the town has that as well. As far as lighting is concerned, there will be a, a specific lighting. You've got the lighting. Um, plan in your packet and the lighting for uh, any safety that for walkers going down to the Snow Canyon Road parking area. Uh, Pine Point Road is full of lights right now, the, the combination of Cobra lights and the halogen, uh, the pole mounted halogen lights, uh, all the way from, just coincidentally, from this point down to Snow Canyon Road. So it's quite well lighted in the evenings. The interesting thing about that is except for very late summer evenings where it might be a storm or something like that, because we're not, uh, we're only a seasonal operation, we're not going to be in operation basically in the daylight savings time, darkness hours. Lighting isn't really that integral, but we do have it. Uh, and from a safety perspective, it shouldn't be any issues as far as that's concerned. Uh, architecture and signage, I will uh, defer to the people who are much more knowledgeable than that than I am. Uh, Ryan will certainly uh, address that here in a few moments as far as the uh, facade of the building is concerned. Uh, I would like to address one issue as far as signage is concerned. There, the original sign, the freestanding sign, which is right next to the building at the moment, when the DOT did its original taking a couple of decades ago, that sign became non-compliant, but nobody really cared because it was well outside of the DOT area and it was there grandfathered anyway. Uh, now we're proposing to move it because, as you well know, anytime any site, uh, any area comes up for site plan review, everything becomes available uh, for, for scrutiny. So we're moving it from immediately adjacent to the building, which is not really conducive for good signage anyway, and we're proposing to put it in the area. DOT lease, and I'll let Peggy address this, Peggy or Joe, uh, the DOT lease also allows us to be able to, uh, to put that there in conjunction with the parking that we're putting in that same area. All utilities are public. Uh, there's no specific outdoor storage. And uh, design standards for commercial districts, I'll let Ryan address that. With that, I would be uh, very open to entertain any questions or comments uh, with the hope, again, at the end of the evening that we can walk away with a conditional approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the board discussion, um, I think, well, do you, I think she's part of the, oh, okay. We, All right. I know she's part of the team, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. I can't help myself. <laughs> um, I'm Peggy McGee. I'm with Perkins Thompson. Uh, I have only two small points to add to that very complete presentation. 
in a very quick period of time. So I'm also here on behalf of three East grants, Sue and Jenny Klo. And there's just, I think, two points that may be of interest to the board. One is that this project is perfect for your zone and for your comprehensive plan. And I just wanted to bring those to your attention. You have in your future land use plan that this Pine Point Commercial Center, it's a small commercial and service center that provides goods and services to meet day-to-day needs of residents and tourists and seasonal visitors. And it is appropriate for small-scale retail uses, which is your gift shops, and for restaurants, which is what you have here. And it's to have that village sense, which is to be close to the road. And so this is a project that fits the vision of your comprehensive plan and for your town and village center. It also says that this is to be a place for local shopping, business, dining, entertainment, and civic activities for residents, visitors, and tourists. So it's consistent with what your vision is. The only other point that I wanted to add to what Jim said is something that Jay had brought up to you and to us is this off-street parking that we have in the Pelletier lot. That's one property over. It's about 1,200. Is that considered by the town a reasonable distance? And what we would maintain that we did talk about that in the application, that a quarter mile, which is, this is shorter than that, is an industry standard for what is considered reasonable. But the town itself is considered reasonable. You have your own municipal parking lot to the beach. And I believe that is, Joe, you and I were doing some measuring on that. That one is about 1,000 feet, linear feet. And then you also have a project, which I believe is going to be done in the spring, for the parking on the far side of the landing, which would go to the beach. So residents could park there and then walk to the beach, and that would be 1,500 feet. So we're square in the middle. We're consistent with industry standards. You've already established that as a precedent, and just I thought that you might would like to know about that before getting to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. I should say, Mr. Chairman, if you've got any questions, or if the board eventually has some questions about architecture, I'd like Ryan to be able to address that really quickly. Okay. If you want to give us a brief overview, go ahead. Otherwise, we can, if there are questions specific to that, then he can speak to it at that point. Okay. Suffice it to say. However you'd like to approach it. Sure. I don't want to drag this on any longer than we need to, certainly. But, again, suffice it to say right now it's a service station. That kind of sums it up. It's not going to look like a service station when we're done. The character is going to be somewhat similar. Again, the building isn't going to change. You do have some architectural renditions in your packet, and I would certainly call your attention to those. We want to try to preserve somewhat of the character. We're not tearing down the building and building something that's going to look like a McDonald's. It essentially preserves the character of the overall area the way it's been for decades, but it spruces it up considerably. Okay. Thanks. Before we do go to board discussion and possible questions, we do have the opportunity for public comment. I suspect we may have at least a couple here who may be interested in that. As Jay alluded to, we have received a bit of a written email correspondence that's all been entered into the record and that we've all had an opportunity to review. If anyone would like to come up, just please briefly come up to the podium, give your name, address, and keep your comments to five minutes or less. Direct any specific comments or questions to the board, and we will do our best to address those through board discussion rather than having any direct back and forth between members of the public and the applicant. But with that, if anyone's interested, please come on up. My name is Linda Lucy. I'm here with my husband, John Riles. We represent Rest Point, 32 owners that directly abut the Conroy's Garage. And before I begin with representing what we would like to put forward as an association, I would like to say something personal first, and that is that 
I find it quite heartwarming, actually, when a member of a community will step forward and enhance the community and continue to contribute to the community. Um, I think that's kind of special. Um, I would also like to recognize the fact that I've spoken to a few people around town and they've done nothing but reassure me that um, you would do a good job and that you would take care of your neighbors and we believe that. Um, that being said, we are direct neighbors and we do care about the quality of life for us in that area. Uh, the areas of priority for us are lighting. We would like to make sure that the light is focused down and not out, lighting us up in our small little vacation community like a Christmas tree um, so that there's some sense of privacy there and a lack of intrusion. Um, so anything that can be done to uh, maintain appropriate lighting would be appreciated. Um, we are concerned about noise. It is a restaurant and you know people go and they have a nice time and they laugh and that's what you expect and want and that is fine. We appreciate that you're closing at 9 p.m. and we would hope that it wouldn't stretch out too long or that the, uh, perhaps if there's a bar, I'm not sure if our hours would work later. Um, we do care about the noise and we would specifically like to ask that there is no outdoor mechanism for announcing tables or outdoor music. We, we value our quiet and privacy. The last item of priority <coughs> is odors. And this is, I think, a particular concern because um, on one of the drafts that I had seen, it mentioned barbecue. And barbecue is endless smoking and endless cooking, so that it's having an impact well beyond restaurant hours, which are already, you know, <coughs> evening and daytime hours to begin with. Uh, we would like to request that there's no outside cooking. It does look as if there's a fire pit there, is that a fire pit? There's no particular objection that we've heard about the fire pit. Um, however, there is a question about seating. Uh, it's not, there's a little bit of ambiguity here about um, the amount of seating where it is, whether it's all inside or outside. And thus far, it appears that there's no longer any seating in the back, and I would like to confirm that that is accurate. There's, it's hard to tell by looking at some of these plans exactly what we are getting. Um, the <coughs> areas that are kind of sub-thoughts uh, sub to the priorities would be just the parking, which actually I took a look um, about a week or so ago, the parking from that you're proposing further up the road to the restaurant, and I did not think it was um, that bad of a walk. I thought it was probably a very easy walk. I, I don't see any problem with the walk there. Um, landscaping, it looks as if you've done a very nice job maintaining both height and low, uh, high plants and low plants so that there's a sense of privacy around your property and yet there's still visibility. I thought that was very nice. Thank you. Um, the last thing I'd just like to say here is, and my husband might think of something that I've forgotten, but the last thing I would just like to say here is that um, as a community, uh, as a community at Rest Point and as a community in Pine Point, um, we look to the town to protect our quality of life and to do what's right for us. And um, I've had limited exposure to the town of Scarborough, but it looks like you do an admirable job of balance. And to the uh, proposed owners, Ben and Sue, we'd like to say that we would welcome you as neighbors. We would like to work with you and make you as successful as we, we can and that we fully expect that it will be a spirit of cooperation between neighbors. Thank you. I'm our husband, we never agree. I left him with the <laughs> <laughs> I am John, with next door also. I still not clear with the seating, so can somebody tell me exactly the 72 seats and where they are? Okay, when, sure. when we, we'll just, if, if it's all right, we'll go ahead and just take any and all public comment, and we're we're taking note of any questions okay. that get raised, and yeah, we'll make sure that it. we'll make sure that we we Where cover that. Is. Yeah, sure. Thank and you. And then the J1 visa is that like something written down? So 
Like it can't be like turn into seasonal, like off season, but it could be rented. I just don't know okay. the answer to that. Well, okay. We'll we'll uh, clarify that as well. Thank you. And just my overall thing with the parking. I mean, it's a tight spot. Uh, I think having a sign at the entrance with an arrow going that way could really stir up a lot of blockage and traffic there. Could just go look at it and go, well, wait a minute, I go that way, but do I turn around here? Do I do that? You, know, you have a lot of people that drive. And, you know, somebody mentioned the walkability and everything at Pine Point and people coming and walking, bikes and everything. That's what we just say. It doesn't happen. I mean, it happens in some instances, but Pine Point is getting to be a real car magnet. And, you know, the Bay Shed has, you know, you have valet park in there now, which I understand. But it's a lot of cars. And that's something you guys got to think about. It's, it's, they're not going away. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Satlack. I live at uh, 2 East Grand Avenue, directly across the street from the proposed project. Um, my wife and I have lived there since uh, 1989. I, I want to take just a brief moment to uh, acknowledge the Conroys. Um, they were in an, a, a wonderful business. They um, were so uh, connected to the community. Um, they were always looking to um, help people. They were the best neighbors. And I would really like to be able to enthousi enthusiastically um, support this uh, project, but I have some reservations about the sheer scale of it. Um, what's being asked for by the applicant is uh, a 72 seat restaurant, but I think the real impact of the project is a bit bigger than that. Right now in the uh, current uh, <coughs> package of information it shows 68 seats inside but it doesn't show any seating for the outdoor, a patio area. And in reviewing some of the submissions for this project, um, uh, particularly one w that was uh, submitted by uh, Northeast Civil Solutions in July of, of uh, this year, there was a capacity for up to 146 seats. So I think that this is our, our bigger project than the 72 seats that are being asked for in the applicant's proposal. Um, and all of this is within the context of a fairly dense residential area. Um, there are 30 or so uh, units uh, next door in the condominium area. Um, a number of those. Um, um, folks uh, live a far distance away. I'm not sure exactly how much input they've had or how much of an opportunity they've had to review this project. And then across the street, there are some single-family residential units. This project is going to have a tremendous impact on them. And I'm hoping that at some point um, I will be able to enthusiastically support this project, but I wanted to just quickly review some of the concerns that I have about it. The first is I think it's going to create a significant amount of off-street and on-street parking problems. And uh, the applicant and the applicant's engineer um, engineers have uh, indicated that the off-site parking is a quarter of a mile away, and that's a reasonable distance to walk. But I'd like to ask the board to consider whether um, it's reasonable to expect that people will be parking there. Um, if I was attempting to go to this restaurant, I would try to find a parking space as close as I could to that facility. And that will either be on two East, uh, e either on East Grand Avenue, or it will be on the Pine Point Road first, uh, uh, a quarter of a mile, uh, uh, two is a short distance, but if it's raining, if it's cold, 
people are going to try to get it park as close as possible in, uh, to this. The second uh, issue, uh, I think, is just around environmental quality problems. And I'd like the board to consider what it would be like for each of you members to be living next door so close to proximity to such a intense use. Um, it is eliminating some wetlands. And this is an area that's um, particularly sensitive to flooding. flooding. I I'd ask the board to keep that in mind and take that into consideration. Uh, I recognize that the applicant has um, on a traffic study that has been peer reviewed. And, and I understand I'm just a guy from the neighborhood. But um, it would appear to me that the uh, timing of the, uh, uh, the traffic study is not necessarily representative of when peak period traffic conditions are in existence. Um, the, the, the surveying that was done there was uh, uh, done, I believe, on August 22nd. That's uh, Monday. That's the Monday before people return uh, to school. Um, you know, my sense is, is that uh, perhaps further consideration of exactly the traffic impacts on times that I've observed the traffic is most intense, the peak season being more uh, July and into mid-August, the days of the week being more Thursdays through Saturdays. Um, I think that there's a potential for uh, this uh, project to create a lot of additional noise and will have a real impact on the, especially the people that live closest to this. Um, and, and there are real, some real questions as to exactly what the nature of the outdoor activities are going to be. How many seats are outdoors? Is there alcohol going to be served? Um, will there be cooking outside? Uh, um, will there be live music and live entertainment committees? I don't think any of these issues have been explored uh, in enough detail to really consider what the real impact of the neighborhood that's closest to this will be. And finally, the last <coughs> issue is, is the, the whole utilization of a public right-of-way for, for this private commercial use. Um, the use of uh, right-of-ways has been an issue in the Pine Point area. Um, uh, people's, uh, the public's access to these right-of-ways has been contested uh, from time to time. So I'd ask that the board take this into consideration. So I would like to see the right type of use here, and I would like to see the applicant be successful. But I'd like to see the uh, applicant uh, um, perhaps resubmit uh, and, and, and just take a good look at just the, of the following things. Uh, That's all right. We, you're, you're already a little bit over the, the five minutes. If that I we could just be very quick. We, we have all of your written material, so okay. I just ask you to wrap it up because okay. it, is, it if, is getting late. If, if, Thank if, you. I could, if I could, uh, I guess, just wrap it up very quickly. Um, I was walking from the, the Snow's parking area to my house, taking a look at the, visit, the village concept as it is as it really exists. And what I see is some very heavy and intense industrial uses at the Snow's Canning facility. I see seafood processing area across the street, Ready Seafoods. I see two very intense uses, a 700-seat restaurant on one side, the clam, clam bake. The landing, which is a 6,800-square-foot um, uh, entertainment conference center on the other. And now, you know, is this really a village concept that is creating a certain diversity of use? Or is it increasingly intense utilization where the burden of this development is placed on the people that live closest to the area? 
So I thank you very much for considering my comments. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. My name is Rachel Robidoff, and I am on 8th Grand Avenue. I, um, I agree with my neighbors. I, I believe that I don't see the perfection in the plan. I, I, I do feel that thoughtful planning from the board to have a, divor a diverse city center. I think we've been really downplaying, though. I, too, did the walk with my neighbors. I walked through the parking area, and I also walked the distance. I know that in the summer, there are cars parked the entire length of that road um, in front of the landing along, and I'm speculating there is no sidewalk. So with all the cars parked along the side of the road, will the pedestrians be walking to and from this satellite parking lot in the road, or will they be, you know, that's something to think about because there are cars lying the entire distance. The other thing, so there will be cars coming in and out of this one entrance parking area. I see this cluster of cars coming in and not being able to get out. Once it, they see it's full, they'll, where do they turn around? I just, I just don't understand how this is going to work, the congestion it's going to create, the one entrance in and out, as well as our friends at the clam bake in and out of there. And I, I just, I, I cannot, and it's also close enough to where people from away, they hesitate, which way am I going, is it, you know, it, it's not that clear, this intersection, to compound it by this one entrance, and then once you get in there, where do I go, how do I turn around, um, that's, I, I just don't see how this is going to work, and there's, there's so little parking on the street as it is, so, the parking's a big concern, and honestly, downwind. We, we all love barbecue, but it will be the barbecue 24-7 for um, seven months out of the year, which is great, but um, not ideal. Not our perfect village that we were describing. So I'd like you to consider those issues as well. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Richard Bryant, um, and I sent a letter today, which uh, I think Hans indicated he'd give me a hard copy if I have extra copies if the board needs it. <clears throat> I represent Cecilia Don LLC, which owns the property on which the Clam Bake Restaurant operates, um, and our concern is really parking. Uh, there are a lot of positives to the uh, proposal that have been presented, um, which might be good for the town and the abutters and certainly for the site owner, but there is a really significant drawback to this, and that is the off-site off parking. Um, adequate parking is critical to restaurant business and other retail hospitality businesses. Um, my clients have been running the Clam Bake restaurant for decades and decades. They know how parking works. They know how patrons drive there. Um, they know that managing their parking on their own lot is really difficult. And they know it's also nigh impossible to try to manage uh, parking off the site of your restaurant. Um, they have experience with parking across the street with other facilities. So the landing at Pine Point um, oftentimes has uh, functions which exceed the parking at the landing. Those parkers want to come right across the street and park in the parking lot of the clam bake because it's 50 feet away. Unfortunately, every space they take up in the clam bake's parking lot is a space that a clam bake's patron can't use, so it affects the business. My clients actually have to pay their own people to go out and police their own parking lot to make sure when events are going on across the street that their parking is not taken up by patrons of the business across the street. So they lose not only <coughs> the cost of the policing it, uh, the parking lot, but they also lose the revenue for those whom they don't, they don't catch or they don't, uh, can't deter from using their lot. Signage is important, and I know that the, uh, uh, the applicant has proposed 
extensive signage, but signage doesn't work for those parking problems. It just doesn't work. Um, what will happen is that those clients who drive into this 20 space lot for a 72, at least 72 seat restaurant and find there's no parking there will find out how to turn around, come back onto the only entrance on Pine Point. Maybe they'll understand, oh, there's a parking lot a quarter mile away down Pine Point Road. But when that patron drives out of the lot, they will, if they turn left, they will be looking for the first available parking space. There are four commercial properties with parking lots between this proposed project and the remote parking that they say is going to serve their needs. And just like water seeking its own level, those parkers will all find the first open space they can, and that's going to be the clam bake lot. And if it's not the clam bake lot, then it's likely to be the landing lot, or it's likely to be the ready seafood lot. Um, they will find whatever parking space they can between the restaurant that has an inadequate parking lot and this overflow parking, which is a quarter mile away. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. There's been comments about um, the distance not being very far. Well, I, I can certainly walk a quarter mile. Plenty of, plenty of other people can as well. But there's a difference between the analogy uh, or the uh, example that the applicant gave of the Avenue 5 parking lot, which they say is 1,000 feet from the beach. Well, the rear end, the back end, the most distant end of that uh, Avenue 5 parking lot is indeed roughly 1,000 feet from the beach. The front end of that parking lot is 50 feet from the beach. It's right there. And the most important and critical difference here is that someone who parks in the very last space of the Avenue 5 parking lot to get to the beach has zero available options closer to the beach. There's no place else to park. When, you, when somebody is parking at the overthrow parking lot for this proposed project, there are at least, as I say, four commercial properties with parking lots between the destination and the remote parking. Those drivers are not going to drive the quarter mile down to park so they can walk a quarter mile back to dine, to turn around and walk a quarter mile back to get in their car and leave. Um, it's nice to talk about uh, pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic. That's a great thing, but I think it's unrealistic to expect that a business will support itself on people who in the community who are biking and walking to that site. Um, it's simply not going to happen. So the real problem here is that the developer is trying to put too many parking intensive activities on too small a lot. And the difficulty there is that the price for that parking ends up getting paid by the abutters who have their own parking lots that they've developed um, and that they have to police. And that's simply not fair. So I think that a different, a smaller project, a different type of project, some other use that is not as parking intensive might fit really well on this property, but what they're trying to do is put too many parking intensive uses in too small a space where they don't have adequate on-site parking. I would cite you to a couple sections of the ordinance. I set forth uh, those sites in, in my letter. Um, the site plan review ordinance requires that parking lots be accessible and organized to serve the motorists while being safe and pedestrian friendly. I don't think you can reasonably suggest that a parking lot a quarter mile away that has other parking alternatives <coughs> in between is truly accessible in any reasonable sense, in any practical sense. And I'm not certain exactly what the, what the pedestrian situation is along Pine Point Road, uh, if indeed uh, there are not defined parking spaces along that road and not a defined um, a pedestrian walkway that's separated from the roadway, then you may well indeed have, have pedestrian issues as well. One of the abutters brought that up as well. Um, I'd also note that um, the planning board does have the ability to reduce the parking requirements, uh, but that requires a demonstration that the nature or operation of the proposed use will not necessitate the minimum parking space requirement. Now, 
That's simply not the case. I don't think the applicant has demonstrated anything other than citing that, gee, people want to ride bikes and walk to our restaurant. Um, I don't think that's a sufficient uh, reason for you to um, loosen your standards as to what is a reasonable parking requirement for this project. Um, and then there is, I know that the applicant is act, asking the planning board for a waiver of one of the requirements, because in this zone, the lots have to be either at the rear or side of the building. Um, and they're saying that that's not feasible to do. Um, but I would note that that section of the ordinance does require parking lots to be coordinated with building, in, building entrances. And there's no way you can talk about a parking lot a quarter mile away as being coordinated with building, in, building entrances. Um, and I, my conclusion from that is I don't, I don't think the, uh, uh, the overview ordinance, excuse me, the, uh, the site plan ordinance really contemplates this type of distance um, off-street parking for this type of project. There is a provision in the shoreland zoning overlay zone um, which deals with changes of uses of non-conforming structures, and I think the applicant has acknowledged that this is a non-conforming structure, um, doesn't meet the applicable setbacks. Um, and that requires that the planning board determine that the use of the non-conforming structure, uh, excuse me, the change of use on the non-conforming structure um, have no greater impact upon various items, including adjacent properties. And I'd suggest to you that you I'm can't give you a good conscience. One, one minute warning, please. I'm, I was going to suggest to you that you can't in good conscience okay. say that this, uh, this project, as uh, proposed with this distant off street parking, doesn't have an, infer, in that, excuse me, an adverse effect upon adjacent properties, particularly by clients' property directly across the street. Let's see. I just want to check my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything important. So in, in conclusion, I do think that, uh, that this is a project, while perhaps well-intentioned, is really too big for this lot, and it will clearly have significant adverse effects upon my client's property across the street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to make sure we we get any other public comment and then we'll then we'll definitely have opportunity for the applicant to respond and for the board to ask questions as well. Is there anyone else from in the audience? Okay. Um, we want to. Okay. Just please uh, keep it keep it brief. We are. Thank you. Peggy McGee with Perkins Thompson, and I, there's only one point that I wanted to make. Uh, there is not an ordinance standard um, that talks about the uh, folks being drawn to a nearer parking space. I think anyone who goes to the old port or to Trader Joe's, you, you, you see that there are com competing spaces. People, that's why people mark their spaces. This is for the dry cleaners. This is for um, the florist. Uh, because you do have the human condition where someone may want to park closer, but that is not an ordinance standard. And I'm sorry that the letter was not provided to us uh, by uh, Mr. Bryant, uh, but if there are any other concerns raised from that letter, we appreciate that opportunity to see the letter. And respond. Thank you. We'll start down at this end this time. Rick? Have anything? Oh, you first this time? Yeah. <laughs> what better ready? one to start with? I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. Um, can you tell me, is that, how do they turn around when they get in there if, they, if there's no parking spot? Is that that area that's ashed off there? Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, where do people park with the traffic circulation? Excuse me. This is the, uh, uh, the means of ingress, egress. People will pull into here park wherever they can. If there is no parking available or when they pull out to, to leave after they parked here initially, uh, this is the turnout area, this backup area, or forwarding in here, backing into this section, and then being able to remove the, the uh, to leave the site. Um, all this has been reviewed. There's no issues as far as the turnouts are concerned of the area to be okay. able to, uh, to turn out and leave. All right. And then as far as the parking lot that's in the snow cannery, is there 
are they going to come out and walk down the sidewalk on the street, or is there a path between the two? I didn't see on the drawing. That is. There is actually a sidewalk in place. That's and, what I was looking for. And they're going to be, the, the town has got a uh, provision uh, whereby this coming year, the town's actually going to be redoing the site, uh, the Pine Point Road from here all the way down to here. Uh, new road, new certain new uh, uh, drainage, uh, new sidewalk, et cetera. Chair, and there is Corey, a sidewalk there do you now. mind if I speak to that a little bit? I probably can shed some light on our project sure. coming up um, next year. Um, yeah, so right now the existing condition is paved shoulders on both sides of Pine Point Road, which is not... The, right, it's paved shoulders right now that people are parking on that's not designed for on-street parking. So one of the things that the town has been struggling with the past year or more was trying to figure out how to do that safely. And so that's what we've gone through with the Transportation Committee is worked on um, actually designing on-street parking for the landing side of Pine Point Road. Therefore, when we're done, you'll have um, on-street parking on one side, bike lanes on both sides, and there is an existing sidewalk now on the landing side, which will be um, reconstructed. So basically there will be no more parking on the clam bake side of like on-street parking. Um, that will be essentially the bike lane on that side. So um, there'll be some amenities like some bump outs um, for where the crosswalk might go closer to ready seafood. and. Um, and some drainage, as you mentioned, because um, we'll ha be creating some pockets in there. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that what might be taking place now for on-street parking on Pine Point Road um, may be very different next summer. Thank you. Thank you. So can you <coughs> show me where the parking lot is and where they're going to walk? <coughs> yes. This is our restaurant right down yep. here. This is the site. This is the parking area right here. Yeah. This is the area, obviously, just following these arrows, coming right down the existing sidewalk to this point, right in here. Okay. And then are you going to put a sidewalk? Is once they get to that parking area, they're going to basically come off the sidewalk and walk down that road? Yes. The sidewalk ends right here. Actually, the sidewalk ends up here, but the sidewalk typically ends here, and people would just walk down this area. There are Cobra lights all along here. Uh, Cobra lights and the halogen lights all around here. So from a lighting perspective, it's perfectly safe. Uh, this road is very minimally used now anyway. Uh, at the time that many of the people will be parking there, it will be completely naturally lighted uh, or it's unnaturally lighted by coming into this particular area. So there shouldn't be any issues as far as safety with lighting is concerned. Okay. This is a graveled road, right? Here. Well, actually, this is a paved road to this point, and then it's graveled road and it gets over here. And as far as signage, I see the sign that says parking for, you know, you're going to in the parking lot, you're going to have a sign that says that it's, for the barbecue only, but is there any indication at the street that that parking lot is for the restaurant? Yes. Uh, there's a sign here for anybody coming out of the restaurant I mean, who's wondering, and yeah. then there's a sign, this sign is right here. So there's um, no sign before the parking lot? I mean, uh, from the bridge? No, it's this sign that would indicate additional parking in this particular area, and then there's a sign right here where the parking area actually exists. So we've got three signs, essentially, one at the parking, one direction for both arrows or both uh, lanes of traffic, and then one down here at the restaurant itself. Okay. And your your traffic study was based on that road being 25 miles an hour coming down from the bridge. I'm guessing that's accurate because I've been speeding a long time today. <laughs> <laughs> I know Pine Point. I, I, I know you. I know there's a sign there now. I thought it was basic, I thought it's because of the construction. Because as you're coming over that bridge towards the beach, I don't recall seeing, and I don't have my Google Earth up where I look, but um, I don't recall seeing. But that's definitely 25 miles an hour. That's what the study was based on, but it really only impacts entrance. Okay. Okay. All right. And then I just have one last question. Sorry. You never know me to ask questions. <laughs> um, as far as the dwelling that's in the facility itself, is that how many? Um, I know there's no parking for that 
antique, but how many um, people do you anticipate are going to be living in that? Um, it, it depends on operations, obviously, but it could be 12 to 16. Uh, it's actually, uh, right now, it's, it's set up for 20, and there are, there's an allow a, a fire code allowance for up to 20. They don't expect to come anywhere near that number. Okay. And there's no cars? Nope. For those 20 people? Nope. Okay. That's all I have. Ms. Chair, can I just follow up on that point? Sure. Um, just a couple of things. I um, do just want to note that per the revised parking assessment, they are required. Essentially, when our uh, town attorney looked at the request to have J-1 employees in there, that was sort of where this discussion started was, hey, look, we're going to use this dwelling for J-1 employees. This is something a little different than your typical dwelling unit. We don't need parking for it. But when our attorney, or actually the the letter we received from the applicant's attorney and then reviewed by our attorney essentially said a dwelling unit is a dwelling unit. We, the town's ordinances, doesn't differentiate between whoever's using it, whether it's the J-1 employees or if it's rented out seasonally. I think that was one of the questions was how do we know it's not going to be rented out seasonally? Frankly, we don't. It could potentially be rented out seasonally. So this board's job is to look at what's being proposed as a dwelling unit requiring two parking spaces, which is part of their parking analysis, a 72-seat <coughs> restaurant, and that we can sort of, I think, one of the questions was where are those seats going to be, so we'll probably get into that, and then the retail spaces. So I just want to be clear that, you know, the J-1 employee thing uh, uh, element might inform the board's discussion, but really what this board is approving is the existing dwelling unit that's on the site. Um, one of the other things I guess that's worth mentioning now, um, it was sort of flagged about the shoreland zoning ordinance requiring uh, non-conforming uses, um, change of non-conforming uses to have a certain a different degree of review. Um, the town, um, and based on uh, uh, discussions we've had with the state about shoreland zoning, the use, the use is really commercial. It doesn't differentiate uh, between sort of the former gas station service center and restaurant. It's, it's a, the shoreland zoning ordinance, overlay ordinance, when it talks about change of use, it's talking about going from residential to commercial, or it, it has uh, more broadly defined uses than our zoning designation, which gets into restaurants are a different use than a retail is a different use. Um, so I think just in terms of what the shoreland zoning, I just want to be, again, clear on that, that um, in terms of the town's review, these, this is an existing commercial and residential uses on site. Okay. So. And I saw where there were four spaces, so. I, I guess I had one more question. I'm sorry. Um, as far as that DOT lease is concerned, I'm not exactly sure how those work. Is that for a period of years? Is there a duration associated with that? Or is that a, it has to be renewed every year? Or I'm sure. If I may, I'll leave that to the person yeah. who managed it. Well, we may already have that, and I may have missed uh, it. The, at least, uh, the, it is a lease. They call it a license agreement. Um, it does um, automatically renew, and the uh, MDOT cannot just willy-nilly terminate it. It puts its conditions, whether it, there's a public safety issue, it could terminate it, or whether it has its own public need for it, just as it could with the eminent domain proceeding. So in the agreement, it says, this keeps going unless we have a public safety concern or we have a public need or uh, you uh, default on the, the terms uh, of, the, of the lease, of the license okay. agreement. Does that answer your concern? I think so. Angela, I mean, as far as that <coughs> reconfiguration of that or the proposed reconfiguration of that intersection, mm -hmm. Does that DOT right away come into play in any of that that you're aware of, or what are they? Um, right now, we did we have started the master planning down there. We've we've mm -hmm. gone through a couple of sketches on um, kind of I call it worst case scenario as far as size goes, and um, it doesn't impact where they're developing right now. That being said, it goes back to her comment, I think, with DOT is um, if we needed that, it would go back. We would be looking for funds probably through the state anyway or federal funds to do something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think with, uh, we've shared that actually with the applicant, those, those sketches and laying out of that intersection and pretty confident that it wouldn't get bigger than what we've kind of proposed out 
Um, so I'm pretty confident that we wouldn't need that as part of those that intersection work. That being said, there's always the what if that we would have that opportunity, I would think. And if I may, I've had conversations also with MDOT, and the, um, the plan they have would only make it better for us, not not worse. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Rachel? <clears throat> yeah, uh, a couple of observations. I was uh, just looking at the plan, uh, the internal plan um, for the facility, and I noticed, and I'm sure this is a mistake, <coughs> Uh, just in labeling, but you've listed two men's rooms and no women's rooms. <laughs> so I, 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 yeah, I can, you know, I can tell the difference when I look at it. But um, that's, that's labeling. Uh, and I look at the upstairs again, you know, taking into consideration what Jay said our, our work here was, but. Um, I did notice on one bedroom you have no closet, so it's actually not really a bedroom. There's a potential for six bedrooms up there. Um, one of the bedrooms has got three <coughs> doors, including one outside door. Uh, and I question the number of people that will end up being put in there. I, I know there's a potential, it looks like, a potential for <coughs> six bedrooms. Um, that's kind of... I have a labor union background, so I have a real concern about um, employees being treated appropriately. So that's one of the reasons I took a look at that. Um, I have been to the la events at the landing and had to park on the side of the road, uh, and I felt I was taking my life in my hands trying to walk down to the car. Uh, so I remain having a concern about um, the location of the uh, off-site parking, um, specifically around pedestrian safety. And if there is going to be a sidewalk that's going in, that um, <coughs> does resolve some of my questions, but I still have concerns around the, the off-site parking and the amount of parking available. Thank you. Thank you. Robin? Yeah, so I'd like uh, to address some of the comments that the public has made. Um, first, I'm going, I, I made a list of six that the first, uh, the first uh, um, woman had noted. Uh, first, the first one being lighting, Jim. Yes. Um, can you talk about outdoor lighting and make sure that it meets the town standards for cutoff lights and downward, downward? Um, it does, oh, and the interesting thing as far as the, the person who brought that up is that uh, there won't be any lighting on that side well, other than on the building, you know, just security lighting. I don't care what side, is it going to comply? Yes. Thank you. Two, the noise. Are we going to have a PA system outside? No. Excellent. Thank you. Um, was that? I think that was the, was the only noise concern kind of a thing, and no ticket orders kind of thing. Three, the odors. Um, and I understand this is kind of like a, a restaurant thing. It depends on what you're serving. But I would assume that you're going to have a mechanical services person, if not already the architect or someone else involved, who can get a scrubber there to get those odors out. But can you also speak to the fact whether or not barbecue will be done outside? Yes or no? Will not be done outside. Okay, so it will be interior, so you can have scrubbers for those types of things. Um, for seating, can you talk a little bit about inside and outside seating? Yeah. Has anything changed? Uh, no, not not recently. Okay. But uh, there w I think one of the gentlemen who was here earlier talked about, or one of the people, um, was referring to the initial the sketch that we were looking at last, last summer. This yeah, past 140 summer. versus 72 seats. Right. And uh, we were looking at that point at utilizing the entire building. Okay. And uh, we weren't honestly at that point looking at the overall parking, which is given the building size, how many could be there. Okay. And this is what we, that was what we came up with, never having an intention of actually going there because obviously we have to back in from that number to be able to provide that number of spaces and seats. How much outside, Jim? That's going to fluctuate. Uh, okay. Overall, we can only have 72 seats. Okay. The inside of the building is going to be capable of taking up seating 68. Okay. So there, at a minimum, there would typically be four outside in pleasant weather. We could take half of the seats that are inside, if it's an absolutely stunningly beautiful night, which most of them are in the summer yeah. in Maine, and put them out on the patio. Perfect. But we cannot exceed that magic number. Thank you, and thank you for your for being so succinct. I really appreciate it in the interest of time and the rest of my board members. Um, 
J1 visa, we talked about that. Hopefully that was, was resolved. Um, were there, um, I'll, I'll leave it to my colleagues to bring that up more. Um, parking, um, I, I, I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about um, parking issues. Um, have, have the area businesses talked at all about sharing parking? We have not spoken to anybody about that. I mean, the area, well, actually, we, not officially. It is very rare that I ever see the clam bake full of parking. Very rare. And I understand that the, that the current attorney is here for that restaurant. But let me just give you a background of what my day job is. My day job is working with people who basically fight over impervious cover and who has to pay what for the, for the impact fees associated with them. And in, in certain parts of, of Scarborough, um, if you have uh, uh, impervious cover in the Long Creek watershed, you have to pay $3,000 per year, per acre of impervious cover that you have. So, and then if you go to Portland, a municipality not too far from here, they have a, a stormwater utility fee. So every, whether it's your buildings, your parking lots, your roadways, your sidewalks, you have to pay, pay a fee for whatever pavement you use, including parking lot spaces. So it's really brought a lot of collaboration among area businesses. For example, you know, a doctor's office in the morning could be the parking spot for the bar next door at night, and one of my favorite examples. Um, but anyway, um, what would have been really impressive is if the, the local businesses could have come together and made a proposal together that, that, that something could have been done in that area. That would have been really, really impressive because, like I say, in my day job, I work with people who are, who are basically fighting over who has to pay what impacts for impervious area. Um, what I will also agree with with the, um, with the general public is that maybe the traffic study may not have been necessarily perfectly representative of peak traffic in the, in the Pine Point area. Um, so, but what I will say, and, and one gentleman asked, I want to ask yourself, what would it be like to live so close to this business? I would consider myself very grateful to live in the Pine Point area. And as a Scarborough resident for a lot of years, I have welcomed so many people to this community and to come and share in the beauty of our community. And I really commend the, 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 the business for wanting to bring that to our town and share that with others. With that said, I think all of what's been brought up today is completely negotiable within the community. Uh, but like I said, my biggest disappointment is that parking is so territorial. And the minute that, that the town of Scarborough needs to um, assess a fee for the pavement and the impacts that storm, my, my apologies, I have laryngitis, and the, the impacts that all of that pavement causes to the water bodies throughout um, the town, it's going to be a different story. So let's get it together. Thank you, and good luck to you. Thanks, Robin. You're very welcome. If we, if we could just have one response to Ms. Saunders' comment. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, first, uh, we do have a letter of support from the landing next door um, about um, uh, the project. That was actually unsolicited, uh, 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 saying that they think it's a welcome addition. So we do have the business next door. And um, this is not part of this application, but it is part of what I hear in the planning which is that um, it is agreed to lease the area, that little brown down area you have, um, and there has been a signed lease uh, for those extra spots. So it's not something that we presented to you, but I think that, that you will find that the, uh, and, and this is interesting from a policy point of view, talk about shared parking, uh, uh, certainly, is that something you wanted to address? Okay. All right. Um, it's, it's something that uh, is, a, is a work in progress. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So Susan Cox, applicant. Um, Robin, I, I take your point to heart a great deal um, because I'm fourth generation in this family business and it's 101 years uh, this year the Bailey's Lobster Pound has been there. We've seen a lot of changes. I personally have been there 34 years and parking is always the issue in time. 
and my husband and I have tried very hard to collaborate, and I think at our own expense, we have reduced park parking problems in Pine Point more than anyone else. We've, um, last year, we actually rented space from the town during a period of time when the town wasn't charging anyone after five o'clock to use Heard Park. We're paying uh, rental fees to use it after five o'clock in order to reduce traffic in our area. We've hired valets, which um, any comments that you hear about people not walking or driving, we, we have actual knowledge of this because every single person who was parked went to our restaurant. We kept our own personal parking for walk-in traffic. So we know how many cars were parked each day and how many people ate each day. And there were approximately 40% who were not being parked who were eating at our restaurant. So we have knowledge of that. And for this project, we really want to cooperate with our neighbors. We've tried, and, and I think that seeing this snow canning thing, Henry Pelletier, you know, we, we know everybody down there. We've, we've all been long-term residents of Pine Point. This mm -hmm. is not new. Um, and when we approached Henry uh, Pelletier in the Snow Canning Project, he was, he's all for it. You know, we are trying very hard with our neighbors to make sure the landing, we finally come to an agreement with them as well. Yeah. So while we had no knowledge of um, the attorneys for the claim being here tonight, I think we have tried really hard to work with our neighbors to make it work for everyone. That's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, clearly, um, there's a lot to be said about this project, so I'll dive right in. Parking. Now, if I look at any proposal I've seen come before this board for a restaurant or a pub, we usually end up in a parking discussion at some level. Not only that, we've typically required those same exact restaurants and pubs to work within the space they have to provide us the amount of parking spaces. And what's, what I find a little troubling on this project is if this was a 36-seat restaurant, they have enough parking right here on their own property. But they're asking for 72 seats. And that there, therein lies the real problem. And um, my kudos to the applicant for how hard they have truly tried to find a solution because I've seen parking spaces bleed into three acquaintances LLC at one point. Uh, I believe you guys have pitched another idea for some off-street. And now we've landed on the... I have signage and I'm going down here a quarter of a mile away. You guys have really tried very, very hard to make this work. And I have, and, and I say that wholeheartedly, I appreciate it. And I think uh, something like this is probably, think of a beach community. I mean, let's not deny what it is down there. And for those of you that are abutting this area, this is a beach community, but it's that festive attitude in the summer. Everyone's in a good mood. Let's go get some dinner. We're near the beach. It's a good time. I expect some traffic in that situation. We're not going to solve the traffic problem down here. I think both sides of this, both the homeowner and the people proposing this, are victims of a very bad traffic planning part here. I'm not, that's not on you, Jay. I know you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this little situation down there, it's terrible for everyone that's there. Um, so I, I'm going to bring it right back into the parking. I'm not convinced you have good traffic flow in the current proposed parking area that you have. I'm not, con I'm not convinced that if I found that the parking spots here were taken, I could safely reverse my car, turn it around, put it back in there, and then attempt to follow the signs and take a left in the middle of summer across those two lanes in some, in some way not blocking traffic. Can you show me where crosswalks exist near that corner? from the clam bake side of the road to the proposed side of the road. Are there any crosswalks in the crosswalk uh right up here? Okay. And uh crosswalk is where right right near so you you're gonna have a crosswalk near where you want people turning left and stopping vehicles. What I'm saying is is what's different here is you're now drawing people across the road for a reason. You have pedestrians, usually light pedestrians, probably actually crossing the other way to try to get to the beach a lot of the time that park on the side. You're now going to start draw, drawing people across that intersection to have them come eat. And, and that's going to happen now. So now you're creating a, a safety problem if our pedestrians can't be watched out for with more traffic and in a, in a parking situation that's less than ideal. So those are, that is the bulk of my major concerns going forward with this. And they concern me so much at this point, I, in its present form, am not ready to support what I see here. 
That's my personal opinion. I am one member. I will say this, though. I did hear something that perked my ears up, and in always search of a good solution, um, I heard the words valet parking. Mm -hmm. Now, if the applicant, and, and this is just an opinion of mine again, no, <coughs> um, if the applicant was willing to show a very concrete and hard um, push to say, I will have valet parking, I'm going to pave that lot, a quarter mile is going to be reserved for me, I have a long-term lease on that spot for 20 years, that that's going to be our valet stacking for cars. <coughs> I'm much more willing to say that the valet parkers have to run in and out of that intersection and get the hang of it uh, more than the tourist who's just been down there for the first time ever. Just throwing it out there that I, if that was the proposal at the time, I would probably feel more comfortable about what I was hearing than I, what I see here. And that's just a thought. Um, and then I have some other notes. Um, you know, and part of your parking requirement is due to the usage here. Um, I, th I think you're getting away lucky saying that you only need two parking spots for the dwelling units, of, you know, that, the dwelling single unit that is above the uh, restaurant. I think you're getting, you're getting off lucky with two spots only required by, by ordinance. Um, you have the signage. Long term, looking long term, I know right now it's being proposed as a seasonal place. If this ever ownership changed hands, maybe not the functionality of the restaurant itself, but they decided to go seasonally. You still have issues, I think, maybe. And, I, and it was nice that you did point out a snow storage area, but you have to always think long term. If, if this changes hands and something changes, next thing you know, is it more of a place to eat outdoors? Is it is it going to start drawing a larger crowd to it than it's just 72 seats? You know, Is there more standing room? Are they going to have concerts? Those are things that can change over time and things that we need to be aware of before we approve a design. So. Um, that's just one of the items, and then if this goes further and the current sitting board here cares to hear how I feel about the waivers, I am perfectly fine with uh, waiving parking on the side and front yards. I think that's reasonable given the layout that they have to work with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that number three, the waiver for no paving of the off-site parking. Um, I'm not crazy about that, and I feel... It, and that's a 50-50 thing because I feel like when you pave it and you call it your own and you put a sign on it, you're really claiming that that is meant for this business and we're going to use it and that's ours and we're going to make the best of a bad situation. I understand it comes with some stormwater and environmental uh, trade-offs, but I, I feel like that's a, that's a real surefire sign to show me that you're really serious about not just saying that's where our 20 spots are, but really actually utilizing it and, and making use of it as best you can. I think that's it. I cover it. I think so. Thanks, Nick. Roger? Um, <coughs> yeah, um, actually, before we heard from the, um, the abutters, um, one of my questions was going to be on the off-site off parking. How are you going to control the people who aren't eating at the restaurant from using that space? I was kind of curious about that because, uh, but I guess that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that brown area, and because I I recall one of the earlier sessions with us, uh, that came up. You know when we were talking about uh, some parking area, is, is it, and that's going to remain as unpaved, I believe, right? That's, as, as what? It's not, not it's not going to be paved. Uh, employee parking? Maybe? Um, it's not necessarily this area right here. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily going to be paved, but uh, but we could. Um, this just we. This is an area right now that is fenced in. Uh, the Conroys have been using this area for decades mm -hmm. as a parking area for their own vehicles, um, under a, an agreement that they had uh, with a verbal agreement that they had with previous owners of the landing. The current own, owners of the land. The long answer to your question, but. Uh, the current owners of the landing are separated because of the wetland area. The landing is basically right here. They ostensibly did not care. I can't speak for them specifically, but it was never an issue for, for quite a number of decades. Uh, but it's their land. It wasn't ours. So in conjunction with making sure that everything is copacetic as far as what we're asking, uh, we originally approached the people and they said, well, yes, for a price. And we've been going back and forth with them, and, and just recently we were able to uh, acquire um, that particular section uh, from them 
as far as an agreement is concerned to be able to allow us to use it. We will very likely be back to the board sometime in the springtime uh, to address that issue should we choose to, uh, to utilize that area, which we very likely will, and expand the parking in the immediate vicinity. Why not? It makes absolute sense to do that, which is why Sue and Ben have negotiated uh, through Peggy and Joe to be with the uh, three acquaintances people to be able to acquire that. So yes, we will be incorporating that at some point in the near future. I just think, it, it, to be clear, it's not part of this proposal. No. It is a right. separate piece of mm -hmm. land, and to date, we haven't seen that agreement with the three acquaintances. So right now, I think the board's job is to focus on the parking that's before you and sort of forget about that brown area. When they come back, we can sort of take that on. But at this point, I, it's a separate parcel. Um, and there's an agreement being talked about that we haven't seen. Um, so, if, if and we've been down that path before. I okay. don't want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I may add to uh, Jay's uh, comment on that, yes, there is a lease agreement. But the, the reason why we haven't got come up with a revision on all of this is because the time is it's urgent. I mean, Mr. Conroy wants to get his, I mean, the closing is supposed to happen the beginning of January. And, uh, that, uh, and when... Uh, uh, Jay said that they've been working on a year to try to figure out how, how to address all the standards and how to make sure the parking, they mean it. I mean, it's, it's really been quite um, an, un an undertaking. And uh, so we are at the last moment here uh, trying to get everything um, uh, addressed for you. And we're not able to start all over again uh, with having this purchase and sale contract run out. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I bring that up is because uh, this board may not have the perfect plan it wants for parking, but is this a good project for the town? Is this a good project for your community? Um, with what you know is going to be happening um, this coming year with the redoing of your, uh, your street and the sidewalk and the parking, uh, is, is this uh, something that you're willing to vote on tonight? And that we certainly hope you are. Mr. Conroy, who would like to buy his home in January, is hoping to. I guess I'm all set. Sure. Yeah. I feel caught between the devil and the deep blue sea because I am somebody who absolutely believes that the most important thing in a restaurant is adequate parking. I have taken a public stand here behind this board I don't know how many times saying, it's not going to work. You don't have enough parking. Oh, yes, but it meets the standard. Well, okay, so it meets the standard. Still isn't going to work because it's going to be a success. And when, it's a success, when it is a success, people come. And when people come, if you don't have enough parking, you're up the creek without a paddle. So I don't think this is going to work. However, it's Pine Point. There's the world. And then there's Pine Point. I mean, seriously, Pine Point is an amazing place. This is going to be summer only. The places that I've taken the stand and said, this isn't going to work, you're going to have to have more parking, are year-round places. There are also places that are closer to the city and have no additional parking available to them except what's on their lot. I know Pine Point pretty well. And if this is a really good barbecue place, people will walk from that gray area down to the restaurant, and it will be safe because the town is redoing that entire area. And there'll be, there'll be um, um, sidewalk. So, you know, I mean, I'm breaking my own rules because it's Pine Point. I think, it, I think it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. I really do. And Susan, I mean, after all, they've been doing this for over 100 years. I mean, if they don't know Pine Point, nobody does. <laughs> They know how many people walk into their restaurant that don't take a car. And I, I, I have no problems. I mean, I have problems with it because it's different, because it's unusual, because it's unique. But I, my, my gut tells me that it's, that it's fine. Um, my, my issues are more with things like, um, where is the um, draft motion? Oh, yes. Number three on the draft motion conditions is prior to issuance of a building plan, the applicant will submit a written operations plan for the outdoor seating. I think there needs to be an operations plan for a lot more than just the outdoor seating. And I don't know that I've made a note of all of them that concern me, 
but one of them is, um, oh, where is it? It's in here somewhere. Okay. Do we want to include it will be spring and summer only, April through October? Do we want to say that? That's part of their. That, that, that's part of their proposal. That, that's. I think it's integral to the. It's integral to the review. Okay. Um, the new <coughs> item that has been talked about was the hours of operation. That's the okay. new item that was introduced. Where I've heard, and I guess if you don't mind, Ms. Oglis, um I've heard that they've talked about the kitchen closing at 9, yep. closing the restaurant at 10. Mm -hmm. Is that, okay. And that is, is that in the? Uh, I think that's why I wanted to clarify, so that um, depending on how the board chooses to act tonight, if you want that, see that operation, I would or if like you're happy with staff reviewing it, I just want to be sure we know where we're headed well, with it. These are my concerns, and I don't care whether staff takes care of it or not. I just want to make sure that having us having uh, that we know that it is public notice that it will stop serving at 9, and it will close at 10, and there will be no outside sound. Okay? Um, I also like the idea of valet parking. I've always liked valet parking. And uh, if it doesn't work any other way, let's go for valet parking. There was a, a discussion about how many employees are going to stay in the building, and it was, well, it can take up to so many, but they won't be needing more than such and such. I don't know whether that really is important. Um, if it's all, it's a, it's a dwelling unit. And I don't know whether we have any more control over how those dwelling units are used or not. It doesn't seem as if we do. So we're just going to forget about it. All right, very just, good. Just on that point, I do want to be clear that that, that is what our town attorney right. suggested or stated to the stated board. That is the yep. way it goes. Okay, My, and then there's this one I'm just a little confused about, <clears throat> which is under the, the um, staff comments um, about signage. Um, the application states <clears throat> this whole thing about having moved the sign. Sure, could I, Would you I think I can clarify. So, so the ordinance says once, once an applicant comes before the board for site plan approval, any non-conforming side needs to be made conforming. Right. Um, so this board has no authority to approve the relocation movement of a non-conforming sign. The freestanding sign is a non-conforming sign because it's not on the actual property. So really, at this point, what the ordinance then provides, though, is that you can go to the Board of Appeals to seek a variance. So the applicant, if they want that freestanding sign, excuse me, would need to go to the Board of Appeals. And I guess I uh, thank you for bringing this up because that was a question I wanted to ask the board. That that sign will have to come off the approved site plan, but I think it would be helpful for the board to at least weigh in if you're generally comfortable with that sign location. If the I Board of Appeals were to approve it, is that something that the board would want to see come back, or is that would that be an administrative? Is it in conformance in terms of height? Um, honestly, I haven't reviewed all the um, detailing of it, so at this I would point have no problem with it being moved. But if it's going to be moved, it, it's now going to become a. a if, if it gets board, if it gets approval by the board of appeals, it is now considered a conforming sign. It's a, um, it's a moved non-conforming sign. It's, it's not sign? a conforming sign. It's just a sign for which they got a variance. Okay, I, <clears throat> that's an issue that is open for me. I'd like to know whether it is conforming. You're nodding your head up and down. Yes, it's conforming in all ways except for its location. Okay, it's not it's not higher than our standard is today because that sign has been there quite a while. Yes, um, but, not of which I'm aware. Uh, okay. Please don't hold me to that. So I would like to have that checked. We took a look at that earlier, and that was not an issue. That could be. An element that, that would be an element that get reviewed by the Board of Appeals. And I would like, if, if it isn't in conformance now, I would like it added to their request to the Board of Appeals that that be checked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other than that, um, like I say, I'm, this is, this is going to go down in my diary tonight no. because <laughs> I don't sorry, usually change midstream, but I really would like to have them be successful and I think Scarborough needs what they're offering. And it wouldn't work any place but Pine Point. Thanks, Susan. <coughs> um, Robin, did you have something? Yeah, else? I had two. I Roger. got. Yeah, I got a little um, swept away by the public comments and forgot my own review comments. <laughs> um, so uh, two things that I had noted was that um, the change in use from a garage with limited residential to a very in-demand restaurant 
and um, more concentrated dwelling units is going to have a higher impact on the sanitary sewer district. So I'm wondering if Dave Hughes has been involved in the review and approving whether or not the, it can handle it. This is for either the applicant or staff. Do we know that Dave Hughes is, or Sanitary has been? Yep, Dave Hughes was at our interdepartment meeting. He looked at but it. There's no problems. No, no with issues. The, yep. There'll be the residential. They'll need the to get a, uh, an, a revise uh, a new permit, but okay. outside of that, he has no issues in terms of. So the infrastructure issues. itself is fine. Okay, and then last. They are. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's they are putting in a new sewer line, if I'm if I recall correctly. So. Um, but okay. So the exi you, you said existing sh infrastructure, so that's one to be clear. There Which is has a been evaluated, yes. so whatever it needs is in place. Good. And then last, I'm just wondering if there's been an environmental site assessment of it being used as a garage and the like. <coughs> if any recognized environmental conditions have been identified. Yes, uh, the DEP was out there. There was a VRAP program that was put into place years ago with the removal of the tanks. It used to be an actual gas station, mm -hmm. um, and that's also it's all done. So no other recognized environmental concerns came up. Super. I'm all set then, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Roger? Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, comment on the parking again. Um, I have a slightly different, or actually quite a different view of parking from either my two colleagues on either side of me. I mean, <clears throat> I look at it from a point of view that this is a business that's in, they're investing in this business. Uh, if it meets the parking requirements that the town has, yeah, it's it's going to be their loss if if people go there and can't find a parking spot. Uh, as I've stated in the past, when I go out to eat, if I can't find a parking spot, I'll just go to another restaurant if I don't want to walk somewhere. So it's 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 their investment. They know what they're they're uh, dealing with here. Uh, so that's my point of view regarding the parking. Uh, so I just wanted to make, mention that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So yeah, this is a, I'm torn on this one as well, and somewhere between Susan and, and Nick and share some of the same concerns as others. Um, before I get into my own thoughts on it, I, I do want to, again, thank the members of the public who not only spoke tonight, but also sent written input to us, and um, we always appreciate that, and we always factor it in. I know we don't always end up thinking exactly in the way that some people might want based on their specific concerns, but we we do make a, a genuine effort to try to incorporate that into our deliberations and to try to make sure that questions get answered and addressed through us. Um, so thanks again for that. Um, I really have been going back and forth on on the parking and, and to the point that Mr. Bealey just made. I, I generally agree that um, if, a, if, an, if an application has part of the parking that's required, the minimum parking that's required under the ordinance, then that's that. I mean, I understand that there could be cases where where it doesn't prove to be sufficient. To me, the, the question is, you know, that this is a gray area here where we've got this remote parking, and I think reasonable people can come to different conclusions about whether those off-site spaces are a reasonable distance away. Um, and sometimes, and this, was, this came through, through from some of the public comment, it's not always just strictly a measured distance, a question of measured distance. It's sort of what's the, what's the streetscape, how safe is it, um, what's in between. Um, and I, I live in that part of town, and I live in Pine Point itself, but not too far away. and. Um, I've made a, a point of, of walking and jogging down that area recently with an eye toward that and really thinking about could I picture myself or someone else making this walk? And um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I really do, I, you know, not to make it sound like a magic bullet, but I, I do like the idea of, of ballet parking. The applicant has, has um, <coughs> demonstrated recently that it can be done can be done successfully, and if we do end up approving this as proposed, I would still hope that that might be something that that the uh, the owners would consider going forward, depending on how how things operate. Um, and 
I do, I do intend to put forward a, a motion here with conditions, and I, with one of those conditions, um, I would propose, and it's actually, it would be condition number four since we have some uh, redundant numbering here. Um, but the first one on page two, uh, which speaks to an operations plan for outdoor seating, I might suggest that we include and parking for that. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like in terms of how the how that would be would be worked out, but I I'm thinking out loud somewhat here. But I I guess to me what it boils down to is is trying to have some mechanism for monitoring how well how well and Jay's looking at me very skeptically <laughs> um, how well it works because once it's once that's in place I'm not sure what. What recourse there would be if there are <coughs> issues, and I know that, and I make this point on other proposals that we 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 typically make our decisions based on some basic assumptions about people doing what they're supposed to do, um, but we do get into some of these gray areas, and I throw that out there just as a thought. If, it, if it's, I don't want to put an undue burden on on staff, so I appreciate your feedback on that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I guess my only suggestion to that is it's incumbent upon the applicant to demonstrate that they are meeting the ordinance requirements for parking and so if the board feels they are and that the off-site parking is a reasonable distance that's the sort of standard to apply then that's the approval if the board has questions that it's not a reasonable distance then I think that's I mean to to sort of suggest that the town could potentially monitor how the parking's going without and then at some undetermined point in the future say, uh, you know what, Mr. Business and Mrs. Businessman, your, your parking's not working well anymore. We're going to shut you down. I'm not so sure that that would fly. <laughs> um, so I do think at this point it's really incumbent on the board. To, they, they, they are demonstrating that, I just want to note that they are meeting the parking standards. They are required to have 40 parking spaces. They have 40 parking spaces. The real question to the board is, uh, is that 1,200 foot linear distance um, at the 10 snow canning or snow canning road location, is that a reasonable access? Um, so, right. no, thank I've you. Threw it out there. Yep. Right. <laughs> I do try to work, maybe. I, I promise. I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't want to lean on you too heavily. Um, I will say just on that topic yeah. that um, again to, to what Mr. McGee said, it's clear that the applicant has put a lot of effort and a lot of thought into trying to come up with solutions on this and And we have another solution. If I may. Go right uh, ahead. They've been listening to what you're saying about the valet parking. If you wanted to add a condition of valet parking for the restaurant, they would accept that. Okay. We stop the press. Thank you. Operationally speaking, I haven't in investigated exactly how it would work. I mean, obviously there are parking spaces that exist that would you'd want to use for the restaurant. Um, we could we could offer valet parking to some patrons. We wouldn't want to not use what's already there and only use Snow Canning Road. Um, I think that originally our plan was. Obviously, there'll be some employees in the gift shops as well, and any employees who were not housed on premise were going to be parking at Snow Canning. So that's why we were considering really the walking people from Snow Canning to be minimal. What we're trying to do is open up every parking space nearby mm -hmm. for people who are actually dining or shopping there while leaving the, the alternate parking space for the people who obviously are coming in to stay and work all day. Uh, that was our thought. We certainly work with the valet service. Whether or not it's 100% necessary to have somebody just running 20 cars, you know, that that's up for debate. But if if that's what it takes to get a condition of approval, um, my husband and I uh, certainly we've been trying and trying to get to the board. And this project has had a lot of loose strings that we had to pull together. A lot of different people had to cooperate in order to make it all work. Um, one of the biggest problems um, is just financial feasibility, being that we're a, a seasonal business. Um, we m make all of our money in about 14 weeks out of the year, and if we have to go to one to two more planning board meetings, we miss construction deadlines, we get put off for a year, which means our bank doesn't close, Mr. Conroy doesn't move. It, and, and I know that that's no, 
it's, it probably has no meaning to the board because it's financial considerations, but with a seasonal business, it's not like a dentist's office. We can't just say, well, that's okay, we'll, we'll open in October. Um, that's an entire year's worth of earnings for us. So that, that's the reasoning behind some of what we've done. I just want you to understand we've, we have given a great deal of thought to it. Uh, it's not something that we just sort of said, well, we'll just grab this parking and it'll work out. We've thought about how it would work. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. I'll offer my personal thoughts since I was the, probably the most ardent um, aggressor here. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it's a good solution, and I appreciate you offering it because, one, I think it takes care of your neighbors. It's not a, it's not a foolproof plan, but it really helps your neighbors. It makes sure that the clam bake spots aren't overutilized for you and they're not doing as much policing on their own dime. Make sure your neighbors that live down the road don't have a car parked in front of them if your valet service is being taught to park them properly. So I think it's a it's a very good solution to what is a hard situation. So I appreciate you putting that forward. Thank you. Uh, and I would hope too to what to what uh, you've said that uh, and 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 elsewhere during the discussion tonight that um, maybe in practice that ends up not being a big demand in terms of how much that actually does have to get used because you're primarily using it for employees or um, and or people are walking or, or walking it from where they live or they're already parked somewhere else in Pine Point because they've been at the beach or whatever. Um, but I, I agree that it's uh, yeah, that, I, that it's a, a good solution and appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, in terms of um, the other the other comments, I won't belabor it. It's late. <laughs> Um, and there may be something else on TV that people are more interested in than this. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I appreciate all the all the public comment. I and I do uh, I do understand. And I think most of us on the board. I know all of us do understand the, the time sensitivity and the financial constraints. Um, it puts us in a tough spot sometimes, and and I and I appreciate that you appreciate that. Um, uh, Robin talked about her day job earlier. Mine is is uh, in development, and Wednesday night I'm going to be on the other side of that podium, not here, but in another community, wearing a developer hat, and I'll be in a similar position. And I understand how that all works. Um, I also understand sometimes it doesn't go your way, but um, we do appreciate that, and we try to be sensitive to that. Um, so I do want to put forward a, a motion and. Um, what what we're thinking here is that we reference valet parking not technically as a condition but in our in our findings of fact uh, kind of underlying underlying findings behind the, our our decision um, so without further ado I will put this forward I move to approve the application of three at East Grand Ave LLC represented by Northeast Civil Solutions under Chapter 405 Zoning Ordinance and Chapter 405B Site Plan Review Ordinance with the following findings and conditions. Findings. 3 East Grand LLC proposes to redevelop property located at 3 East Grand Ave with a seasonal mixed-use building consisting of a 72-seat restaurant, retail space, and residential unit. The property is located within the TBC4 and Shoreland Overlay Zoning District. The Planning Board has reviewed the applicant's proposal for 20 off-site parking spaces to be located at 10 Snow Canning Road. Based on the evidence provided, including the use of valet parking, the Board finds the proposal is reasonable and in conformance with the standards of Section 11.1 of the Zoning Ordinance. 11.1 of the Zoning Ordinance. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review ordinance and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage with the following waiver and conditions. Waiver. Based on the site constraints, the Board finds that relocation of parking to the side or rear of the structure is not feasible and therefore waives the requirements of Section 18E, e, Section 2 of the Zoning Ordinance. Conditions, number one, lease and license agreements for off-site activities associated with the proposed use are an integral component to this application. 
should either the license agreement with the DOT or the lease agreement with JDHS Enterprises be terminated, the site will be out of compliance with their approvals and need to cease operation until otherwise approved. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the traffic impact fee is to be paid. The amount of the fees are to be reassessed based on the revised restaurant capacity. The amount is to be reviewed and approved through staff. Number three, during the construction, during construction, the applicant shall coordinate with the town engineer on the inspection of the on-site dry well. Any identified maintenance shall be completed to the engineer's satisfaction. That's my own note. Yeah. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building plan permit, the plan, the applicant shall submit a written operations plan for the outdoor seating that is consistent with the board's deliberation. Number five, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set is to be revised to address remaining staff comments. And condition number six, a pre-construction meeting is required before the start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and his contractor, and utility company representatives if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with the season senior planner. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> I, just a clarifying question. Um, do we need to, I don't want to belabor this point. I really hate doing this, but I need to. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm finding the proposed parking plan reasonable in the sense that um, largely because there's a valet option. Any other restaurant that comes before this board, I don't want to see a proposal for a dirt parking space a quarter mile away and have that always be that the new standard for this board or for what we consider reasonable parking. The addition of valet parking as an option during peak hours, I'm going to assume the owners no, I don't expect that the 3 p.m. valet parking because there's, you, you get what I'm saying. But um, th that's critical to me. I don't, I don't want to see this, I don't want to see this become a standard. Um, and I, I think we're being accommodating because of location, because a, a horrible traffic intersection, which you guys did not design, it, a very difficult lot to work with. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're clear on this, that, that, that my tepid support of this at this point is, is based on the clients, the, um, the applicants' willingness to to really utilize that secondary lot during peak hours. Had to say it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other discussion, Susan? Um, I'm tired. <laughs> where well, is where, where <laughs> is the um, closing at nine out of the restaurant at ten? Where does that go? Um, so I jotted myself a note here. Um, <coughs> condition number four is that prior to the issuance of a building plan, the applicant uh, submits a written operations plan uh, consistent with the board's deliberation. So I jotted notes that there's to be no PA, no o outdoor cooking, uh, and uh, kitchen closes at 9, closed at 10. How about Otis? Well, that will be taken care of by the inside. So if, if the board so odors, um, if the board so inclined, we could, uh, if that's something the board's interested in, um, probably worth adding a condition that requires a scrubber to be added to the venting system, if that's something that the board is um, concerned yeah, that's about that's above and beyond. Is that standard in most um, restaurants? I don't know the answer to that. If you have something I, I don't recall ever requiring one as a condition of approval. That's right. I, I, I guess I, as that's my that's the answer I can no. provide just okay. based on my experience. How sta how how standard they are as a rule, I, I can't say. I don't know what the ve typical venting system does other than <laughs> vent the kitchen. Whether it has a scrubber in it, that's I. Not my area. And we have seafood processing facilities in this area. And a lot of other activity, and I personally, as just a person with one vote, I don't personally think it's mm -hmm. something we need to impose on the okay. applicant. All right. I'm fine with that. Oh, come, come, come. I'm sorry, but uh, the public comment has been taken, and, and it's much appreciated. Thank you. Any further discussion? We have a second in motion on the table. All in favor? Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you for your time. Yes.
Thank you. Things clear out here a little bit. Three to five minutes since you have uh, and now we have to come back. I think we need to stretch. Right. Right. We're gonna, since we're sort of clearing the room here, we've been at it for all. We're going to take about a about a five minute uh, break here. Thank you.
I need to officially need to do this or not, but we're back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Item number nine, uh, Valentine Development requests the site plan review for lot 118 South Village of the Eastern Village Subdivision, Assessor's Map, R73, lot 139. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see. As you just noted, this application is before you. Actually, there's really two components to this application. There's a subdivision amendment, which is really um, aimed at sort of codifying some of the additional um, activities that are sought for the multifamily development on Lot 118. Um, as board members will recall, this item was before you in November to begin the formal discussions about the application review process. Um, so. Um, I guess what I'll do is sort of um, touch on the fact, so in terms of the, well, I should just mention that this uh, proposal is in the TND overlay district, um, which is one of the town's um, uh, higher density uh, um, zoning districts, as well as provides for flexible standards in terms of space and bulk standards. Um, it sort of enables the board and applicants to sort of work through a host of uh, elements in terms of coming up with the right design and, and densities for the project and that's that's part of what the applicants looking to do um, with the subdivision amendment so to that end just again by way of background um, this lot was always identified as a multifamily lot was originally going to be developed with 28 units um, this approval or this project got approval back in 2006 six or seven, I believe it was, <coughs> so seven. Um, and so that was m many iterations ago of, of zoning changes. And one of the changes that have occurred um, in town is uh, we now have a residential density factor, which allows units of certain sizes to be counted differently. Uh, one bedroom unit of certain square footage is counted at half a unit, and two bedroom units with a certain square footage are counted as two-thirds. Anything over two bedrooms or over those square footage are counted as uh, a whole unit. So why I sort of give you that background is what the applicant is seeking to do is increase the uh, total number of units on this lot from 28 to 53, but really by applying that flexible density, it, the, the, the total unit count is actually 26.82. So I just wanted to provide sort of that background as to um, uh, that element, um, but there are some other sort of more nuanced uh, space and bulk standards that need to get considered in terms of uh, lot area per family in the multifamily. And that's sort of spelled out in my uh, <coughs> staff comments here. Uh, in terms of the subdivision or sort of the global um, uh, um, um, elements of the project that I think we had talked about the last time and are still sort of represented in staff comments are around affordable housing, um, traffic impacts, and stormwater elements. And there's sort of a host of nuanced and, and, and questions around those. So I think as we get into each one of those, staff will be prepared to speak to them rather than sort of going on right now about them. I think it will be more useful and mm -hmm. beneficial in that way. Um, um, then, uh, so that's sort of the sort of overarching development, then obviously as part of the site plan review, the board is asked to go through all the site plan review elements specific to the site proper. Um, again, at our last discussion, board members um, had asked some questions about, particularly about internal uh, vehicle circulation, um, pedestrian access, architecture, and those sorts of details. <coughs> and again, um, you have a host of staff comments um, for board consideration on that. Um, and so, Angela, did you want to touch on anything at this point in terms of um, design, or do you want to wait till those questions come up with yeah, regards to stormwater? I can wait. <laughs> Whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and before I turn over to the applicant and, and his representative, I just, just ask that um, we try to keep uh, presentations and, and comments <coughs> reasonably brief given the hour. Um, so that way we can give this our, our, our best attention and, and sort of let us drive things with our, with our questions and comments. Uh, we've looked at this a few times and uh, still got some loose ends, but um, I think we're all pretty familiar with the basics. So 
Mr. Chair, Take it away. if I could just very quickly, while the applicant is preparing, I do just want to mention um, that you, in your, you should have in your packets or copies of an email from Tom Hall referencing the Housing <coughs> Alliance consideration on the affordable housing discussion, a memorandum from Woodern and Kern uh, doing a civil peer review, a memorandum from uh, Bill Bray uh, dated December 4th regarding traffic impacts, a memorandum from the planning director dated December 7th, a email public comment from a Porsche Hirschman uh, that was dated today, and then I should also note that uh, we had a um, traffic analysis provided by the applicant as well, um, dated, I think it was dated Friday, whatever date that was at this point, probably the 9th if I can do it quickly. So. I just wanted to make note of those for the record. Thank you. <coughs> Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy with Stantec, along with Carrie and uh, Rhonda Anderson of Ballantyne Development uh, here tonight. Do appreciate the board's consideration to take us up at this uh, late hour, uh, given the uh, depth of your agenda tonight. So we're here before <coughs> you for 53 units, as Jay has outlined, and uh, this graphic here is basically just depicting again, setting the stage for the discussion uh, with the proposal for seven new buildings, 53 units, anywhere from six to 12 units, uh, each in the, the various buildings. Uh, we believe these are all uh, high quality, high view, high look uh, for apartment type living. Uh, it is dense, uh, yes, and we've always had that approach and that's part of the, the development theme is to make this a, a tight knit uh, type community. It's on lot 118 of that Eastern Village development. Uh, I think 17, 1.7, 1.8 acre size uh, lot area. Uh, with the 53 units, we'll be providing 82 parking spaces, a couple of different entrances uh, off of uh, Richards Way and, and Federal Way. Uh, utilities fully provided with uh, water, sewer, underground uh, power communications and so forth uh, up and down and within the development area. The latest site plan set and information that we provided you folks was uh, done so in a manner to try to address as much as we could the staff comments that we previously received as well as uh, a lot of the dialogue we had with you folks at the <laughs> last planning board meeting. So uh, we feel like we've made a, a pretty good effort in trying to uh, uh, address those items and I'll look at this site plan here just for a moment and talk about a couple of key specific things and uh, then perhaps uh, we can get into some of the board's questions. But cha most recent changes that we've done uh, with respect to site access, there had been comments about the Eastern Road alignment and how it uh, align with the entrance here off of uh, Federal Way. Here's the Eastern Road going out to Black Point Road and we will talk about in a moment uh, a couple of the topics that have come up uh, most recently with that. But we did make some uh, uh, alignment changes here with the sidewalk and the Eastern trail that will be crossing at this location. This will be a four-way stop controlled intersection, so vehicles coming in and out of our site as well as coming in off of uh, the Eastern Road would all come to a full stop and that uh, should work well with respect to the trail usage here uh, that will, uh, uh, we believe, probably be very active. Entering into the site, we have parallel spaces and then we have a number of perpendicular spaces. And to a point that uh, a number of planning board members made at the last meeting with respect to uh, some of the dimensional standards, what we're providing on the parallel spaces, I'll just point out here, I've now included on the, on the drawing, uh, so 82 parking spaces, as I said, we're going to have for full-size parking spaces, 9 by 19 uh, traditional perpendicular parking spaces, we're going to have 43 of those, so roughly 52% uh, of the spaces that we're providing will be basically a traditional full-size parking space. And we have some compact spaces which will be uh, really kind of slightly compact at 8 foot wide by, again, still the 19 foot deep, so an 8 by 19 space. We have 8 of those, roughly 10%. Uh, and then the parallel spaces, which is probably uh, the, the item of most note with respect to some board comments, <coughs> those spaces will be 7 by 19, 7 foot wide by 19 foot long. And we have 31 of those for about 38%. Now those spaces, uh, the piece that I guess is most important I'm delivering as the message 
from our design perspective is that a seven foot wide parallel space is supported by both AASHTO, which is a kind of a national uh, level design standard, as well as the Maine Department of Transportation and their design manuals. It is a, a, a parking space width uh, that is basically, yes, the minimum, a minimum uh, width required, but it's what they would support as uh, typical parallel spaces. And I uh, requested additional information from a few of our traffic folks within my organization, within Stantec, people who do a lot of street and road design, and they assured me that, yes, seven-foot-wide parallel space was, was adequate. I'll add that we did a, our own little study, and Carrie was helpful in this regard, mm. and uh, going out and measuring a lot of different vehicles, both small and, and uh, large, uh, certainly, and I'm sure most of you have seen that as well. If you were to go to the Prius size or uh, Honda Fit size vehicle, which is a little over five foot wide, to the larger Suburbans and Hummers of the world, which are more like six foot four, six foot five, across. So those are the dimensional, just to give you some perspective with respect to what we're trying to uh, accomplish here. The idea, as we've always said, is that our, our little street access area here is intended on being such that it's, we want people to go slow. Uh, it's going to be tight, uh, but the idea is we have enough space for what we feel will be the mix of tenants with their vehicle styles. We have lots of full-size vehicle spaces. We also have smaller vehicle spaces that we would fully expect those who are driving smaller vehicles would be using. Uh, so we think that we've come up with a, a pretty good uh, mix here for meeting the development's uh, needs. Recognizing as well that our parking ratio is a little over 1.5 spaces per unit, which we think also is supportable by today's standards. So. Um, we made a few other minor uh, changes relative to uh, crosswalks and talking to staff. We added a crosswalk over here as an example. Uh, we've taken away some uh, curbed areas so that uh, through an easement right, uh, we would be able to put snow off to the far end so it would allow a nice smooth uh, ability to come into the site in the wintertime, plow snow, assuming uh, cars would be moved and we'd be able to push snow off to the, the sides here and here. Uh, the applicant does have access rights for that type of purpose on uh, land that is beyond their property boundary. <coughs> so I've got a number of the other uh, plan pieces, but uh, we can talk about those as, as I suppose the questions come up. We talked uh, within our submission about some stormwater management pieces and trying to address the overall picture. As I presented to you uh, at the last meeting, this site Basically, we'll have a closed drainage system and we'll drain into the existing new man-made wet pond uh, that is down over off the eastern road. One of the pieces, though, that I tried to uh, um, bring to the new discussion was basically where do we stand relative to the overall development in the sense of impervious area and what was predicted originally during design. And based on what's been built out to date with what had been estimated at the uh, beginning of construction or beginning of permitting for this site, we're actually slightly below the overall impervious area to date. So basically, uh, I had said to you that this particular lot will have a little bit more impervious area than what had been originally uh, calculated in the design calculations, but frankly, a lot of what's already been constructed actually has less impervious area than what had been uh, anticipated or predicted. So overall, we're still like slightly below where we thought we would be at this stage of construction, which is a good thing. Uh, also provided some information and background, recalling that uh, that new wet pond uh, drains to a uh, new culvert crossing underneath the eastern road that the applicant installed way back when, but at the beginning of this project, they put in a new four by uh, six box culvert, concrete box culvert. It seems now to look like it's been there for quite some period of time and is in good condition and certainly seems to be functioning exactly as it had been uh, predicted to function. So uh, happy about that. Uh, then finally, the, the latest piece uh, that we provided you with some information here on Friday, and that is with respect to the uh, uh, Eastern Trail crossing on Black Point Road. So we have the intersection of uh, Eastern Road, uh, both legs, as well as the Black Point Road, and then the new 
Eastern Trail crossing that the uh, town put uh, a couple of traffic signals, not traffic signals, but push button, uh, I think they call them the uh, rapid rectangular flashing beacons uh, with the lights. So the pedestrian using the trail goes up to the uh, pole, presses the button, the uh, lights <coughs> immediately start flashing, and uh, the traffic along Black Point Road is intended on coming to a stop to allow the cyclist or uh, walker, runner, what have you on the trail, uh, an opportunity to cross the road. It has become uh, a high accident location for probably a number of different reasons. And uh, when finding out this issue uh, with staff last week, uh, we did have at least a day or so to uh, allow one of our traffic folks an opportunity to uh, take a look at it, which he did, and, and has summarized his findings in a memo or a letter uh, to, to me that I've now supplied on to the staff. And hopefully you folks have been able to have a, at least a short opportunity to take a look at it. But foremost amongst that is, one, uh, another traffic engineer's perspective on the issue and uh, the commitment on behalf of the developer to uh, allocate $7,500 uh, to the town to continue further study of that uh, particular location because of its now uh, current issue with, with ac potential accidents and, and so forth. So we think that there's uh, uh, at least a pretty firm commitment. Uh, I'll note that the letter, uh, our traffic engineer, in understanding what the trip generation is attributable to this particular development, his take on uh, the fact that we're going to have some increase in development coming from the South Village project, that will have no impact, though, on to the traffic and accident conditions happening on Black Point Road. For the basic numbers, Black Point Road has roughly 13,000 vehicles a day uh, on it based on DOT numbers, back and forth, northbound, southbound. The northerly leg or easterly leg of the eastern road, that has about 900 vehicles a day. This leg from this direction has about 200 vehicles a day. So it's very little traffic as related to, it's the through traffic movement. And the, uh, uh, the letter that we provided, our traffic engineer did a little bit of a summary and comparison of those accident reports and, and outlining what, what's happening. It's basically rear-ending. Vehicles are coming to a stop at the intersection, and those behind them may not be recognizing that the vehicle's stopping, what have you, and they're having some rear-end collisions there. So his, some of his recommendations certainly are, are being addressed towards that particular type of, uh, type of circumstance. So. Uh, we think that that's uh, clearly something, though, that speaks to staff's importance or the staff's uh, statements to us about, well, where do we feel our development fits in relative to the issues there, and we don't feel like we're uh, going to make that any worse uh, by any stretch given the very minor amount of new traffic attributable to the project. So with that, I guess I'd offer to go back to the board so we can maybe get into some questions. Thank you. Um, we do have the opportunity for public comment before we start board discussion. So um, just coming up, we'll give your name and address in five minutes or less, please. My name is Portia Hirschman, and I am a homeowner in the Eastern Village. And I want to say it's a beautiful neighborhood if you've driven through. And it's a group of people who really care about one another and care about the neighborhood. And uh, we have to commend Carrie's overall vision for Eastern Village. It really is a lovely, lovely place. And we all want it to be successful. And to have people who drive through there want to live there. And I personally am excited about the apartments and the hope that we'll have young couples living in the neighborhood because more and more the age of the neighborhood seems to be getting older. But I also will say that with young couples, there are other expectations that come along with that. And there are lots of other new apartment complexes that are being started. So there's going to be competition. So we want this one to be the best it can be and to be attractive. With that being said, I have a couple of concerns. And, and um, some of this has been addressed uh, with some of the earlier projects. Uh, with the in amount of hard surface in parking lots uh, in this particular phase. 
and the drainage to the stormwater pond that, event, that gets to the marsh. And I'm concerned about the amount of asphalt and oil and other pollution <coughs> that can go. And I would love to see a rain garden, something that could be held up for millennials who might be attracted to the apartments uh, as a way that we as a community are addressing a, a pollution problem that we could be generating for the marsh that we all love. And the other issue is with parking. In a market uh, rate apartment, drawing young couples, and you heard this earlier, the experience is they drive two cars. And where else are they going to park? Um, I know that, that the project meets the town recommendations. However, I do have questions about where people are going to park because the streets are narrow and there aren't, there just aren't a lot of places. Um, which takes me to snow storage. Um, I'm not sure that the snow storage is adequate, and by the time you pile up the snow, will that not further erode some of the parking? So I'm, I'm concerned about what will be going on uh, there in terms of parking. So the last thing, well, next to the last thing, is is there a sufficient landscape buffer to Eastern Road and the Eastern Trail? And I think I heard there's a sidewalk now planned over to Black Point. Okay, excellent because traffic on Eastern Road, I walk over there and safety are a big concern. As well as the intersection at uh, Eastern Road and Black Point. I don't know how often, we drive through there all the time and you cannot see the way the, the road configuration is. There's no, there's no question why there are lots of accidents there and we are gonna be generating extra traffic. Uh, on the Eastern Road and, and into Black Point. So I just raised that as an additional concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Start off. We'll start off on a positive note. I want to thank the applicant for addressing the parking with concerns I had last time around. I think you've come up with a good solution regarding that, so appreciate it. Um, I have a question on the ADA compliance piece of this. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's Jay or the applicant can answer this, but with the ADA, 5% need to be set aside of the proposed development in total. Is that, is that what it is? Because they're all into one building, right? And I'm saying this because I'm surprised. I don't know ADA law, but I, w I would just suspect that ADA compliance would apply to each building, <coughs> not one of many buildings. But perhaps you could explain better to me. <coughs> well, to your point, so it, correct, 5%. Uh, so of the 53 units we're providing, uh, basically three units and those are going to be in this building here and Carrie is informing that building G will also uh, be ADA accessible but as I understand it the ADA units are going to be in this building because this will have an elevator uh, in it so that will be the accessible unit and that's why we provided uh, the accessible uh, uh, ADA spaces here and this route is designed to meet all the ADA needs for uh, access, elevator, ADA unit on one ADA unit on each floor for three floors in this building, uh, but this building will also be ADA accessible. So, according to the code requirements, as I understand them from the architect, um, that is compliant. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. and are those other buildings do they have elevators <coughs> or no? They do not. Okay. How tall are those buildings? How, how tall was the two floor, two story? Three story. Three story. Okay. All right, and then I had um, one question regarding the affordable housing. Um, one, we received a memo, and I'm wondering if I could get some clarification on that with accepting pro rata or encouraging us to do pro rata affordable housing. Yeah. Um, Somebody can help me understand that piece better? Yeah, so so I had opportunity to speak with Tom Hall after the meeting with the Housing Alliance, which I believe was on 
Thursday evening, and I'm not sure if Mr. Anderson was at that meeting or not either, but um, essentially the, the essence of it is, um, so the TND allows for uh, developments to take advantage of a density bonus through affordable housing. So when the applicant with the original approval, um, if you look on the subdivision sheets, and you don't need to, I'll sort of walk you through it, um, the net residential density calculation without any bonuses is 156 units. The applicant is allowed through this process um, uh, to increase the, the net residential density by one additional unit per acre. Um, provided they meet our affordable housing standards. So what that allowed was a, an additional 39 units. So 156 plus 39 brings you up to 90, 195 units, provided that at least, um, shoot, I'm forgetting the number right now, 13, 13 of those additional 39 units were affordable. Um, and so what the Housing Alliance is suggesting is Right now, this, this proposal, or this approved subdivision, has eight phases mm -hmm. in which the density is sort of spread out through all the phases. The last phase, phase eight, is sort of an undefined, unapproved um, site. It has density capacity, and it's been sort of part of the considerations, as I understand, in terms of traffic. You know, we've always looked at the total number of units and impervious area but it's only through phase seven in which lots and the specific development is um, 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 approved, so to speak, uh, approved. Um, so what the Housing Alliance is talking about, one, I think it's important to note they're very excited to see affordable housing being implemented into this lot, and so um, I want to be sure that that's made clear. But then what they also want to do is be sure that by the time Phase seven begins, that's when we get over the original 156 threshold and we start to trigger the, the bonus units. And so what the um, Housing Alliance wants to be sure is that by the time, because phase eight is an unknown phase, we don't really know what's going to happen there. I'm sure Kerry has plans for it, but as of yet, there's nothing approved. So what they want to be sure is that by the, when phase seven gets started, the town um, is assured that whatever that density number is through um, phase seven, I'm just going to pick a number because I haven't done all the math. Let's call it 180 units. So, um, you know, that, that the additional density that is through phase seven, we have the requisite number of affordable housing units associated with that. So that may not be the whole 13. Mm -hmm. We know we're using three of them here. Um, and so it may be well by the time he starts phase seven, we do have an approval and we know it's happening in phase eight and that's fine. Or if not, then they'll have to be incorporated at least some number of that 13, not the total number, <laughs> some number. So that's really what that's getting at. And I hope that's somewhat clear. I can. <laughs> it might have been at eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so are they basically saying if, if construction stopped Right after this, that we the town would have realized X amount of affordable housing. That, that's exactly what they're saying. They're they're saying if nothing happens after phase seven, we need okay. to be sure that Mr. Anderson hasn't gotten additional market rate units without providing the requisite number of affordable units. Okay. Thank you. That and how? Much, yeah. that much better <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yes. And how are we you on that <laughs> aspect of, of that? I know you've worked hard over the years here to try to fill the affordable housing units where. Can you just update us on how that's going? Sure. I think Kerry Anderson, Balance and Development. I think what would essentially happen is we wouldn't be issued another permit at that point because we would have come up to the threshold where the rest of the units would have had to have been affordable. We're obviously a long ways away from that, but I think that what Jay is alluding to is the fact that there's going to be a kind of litmus test to make sure that as we're approaching that end point that those affordable units are taken into account. We're going to take six of them, or well, six of them, but we're getting counted for three in, in this particular phase here. But once we reach phase seven, knowing that we still have phase eight, 
and we still have additional density units over there that at phase seven there needs to be kind of like a reconciliation to make sure before we're issued develop, uh, building permits for phase eight that that's taken into account. So phase eight is kind of like the safety measure to make sure that the town gets the affordable units that they're expecting. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. That's just laid out. Um, and one quick question. <coughs> uh, on the plans, I don't know if you see it from where, on the right uh, building, building H, to the right of building H, there's, yeah, right that little spot, is that like a storage area or a... That'll be a uh, trash area here. Okay. Mimicking another one over here and in here. We're looking at actually building some uh, covered buildings rooftop style buildings that will have uh, the uh, trash totes and recycling totes in them. Uh, the idea being we don't really want to have that so it's exposed to birds or whatever or uh, uh, animals and so it'll be a nice, nice, uh, clean, neat area uh, to put the totes in. Okay. And then I think that's it for me right now. It's, I will... Uh, We'll defer the rest of my time to my colleague. Could, could I uh, <laughs> just jump on a, a comment that was just made, and just for a uh, point of clarification, um, I heard that Building G was also going to be made handicap accessible. So the grading plan we have right now shows that there's a step getting into there. Is there is there a revised plan that has a ramp or? There's no step getting into um, Building G. I mean, there's no step. It says, it, says, it says one step. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess that's the grading plan I'm looking at talks about steps, so that's just something we'll, uh, I don't think it's a major detail. I just want to be clear that that's what we're talking about, and we can certainly, uh, we can, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a major impediment, but I just want to be clear of what's being proposed and that we iron that detail out. All right. <coughs> I'm up. Right, thanks. <coughs> Roger. Just, just, just for further clarification, Jay. So, so right now they're going to have three affordable housing units, the equivalent of, in this. That means before the whole place is built out, they have to come up with ten more. Um. Yes. Okay. Um. That's all. Yes. That's all. Okay. All right. <laughs> um. Actually, I, I, I think you've done a, a very nice job, you know, answering our concerns. Uh, uh, you know, from our previous um, e meetings. Um, I don't really have a lot of comments on anything other than I just find it fascinating about that, the traffic situation at Black Point and Easton Road. Uh, and it seems to me that that's all, there's been an uptick in accidents since they've put in the changes there. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and I think... Well, that's worked out well, huh? And <laughs> maybe, I don't know, Angela, do you want to give a little background of sort of the improvements that have been done and how they're coordinated with this project? And Yeah, uh, and again, I was not here at the original approvals, but my understanding was there was um, part of the original approval was to look at that intersection and do some work there, although the town went ahead of that because of the concern about crossings, I believe, at the hmm. Eastern Trail. And making that a safe crossing, the town went ahead and put in those rapid flash beacons, um, as well as obviously the improvements on that corner. I know Carrie had done some, I believe, some curb work and radius and, and as well. But um, it was always intended; it, to, it was part of this project. However, we kind of skipped ahead of that. Um, so as soon as, when those did go in, obviously it's getting people trained that something is there that you need to be looking for, you need to be stopping. It's not only the motorist education, I think even it was put in uh, Stantec's memo, which might not have had time to read, that it's also education on pedestrian and cyclists as well, because it's not a magic button that everything stops as soon as you hit it. Um, and, and that's if someone hits the button, <laughs> because a lot of times they don't do that either. So. Um, one of the things we looked at was um, because we went ahead and, and the town invested that money is to look at, okay, obviously something else needs to be done and we were talking about um, going through the transportation committee to maybe look at that, investigating more um, safety measures for that intersection as far as the trail goes. And it really is focusing on the um, straight through patterns on Black Point Road as well. So the number that it had come up with was really 
just based on um, some a, a recent DOT project we did elsewhere in town about some lit um, advanced warnings of an intersection. Um, so that was just kind of based on that. So that's one aspect that I think is a bigger conversation that um, obviously Carrie needs to be a part of. <coughs> Eastern Village is right there. Um, it was part of his original approvals to look at this, and so I think it will be a, a collaboration between the town and um, Mr. Anderson. But I think that's only one piece of the traffic. I, I know there was concerns brought up by a resident, too, about there is increased traffic from the site. So that's the second piece to the traffic. I think the first piece being the accident and crash rates um, being something the town really needs to work with in a broader sense. Um, I think there's still information that probably needs to be collected from the applicant and um, the designer on what the impacts really are. I think there was some statement in there about five to ten trips and I guess there's nothing really, I, I think Bill Bray might have had a chance to look at it, I'm not sure, but talking about how that is backed up with some, you know, backup information that the town just doesn't have at this point. Mm. Yeah. Does that make um. sense? And, and maybe here. <laughs> I did have a meeting with uh, Tom Hall, <coughs> excuse me, I did have a meeting with Tom Hall and Dan Bacon last week, and I agreed that we would uh, 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 collaborate with the Transportation Committee on finding solutions to make that crosswalk a better one. Uh, engineer, traffic engineer from Stantec has uh, laid out a number of recommendations that he thinks would make it a, a better crosswalk. We've come up with some ourselves and, um, and that was something that uh, both, the, both Dan and Tom agreed uh, would be something that would be worthy of um, uh, post approval to meet with the transportation committee to find ways of making that a better crosswalk situation and in, and also along with that contributing $7,500 <clears throat> towards those improvements which is advanced signage, possibly change of lights, uh, information for people crossing Black Point Road and, and whatnot. <coughs> I'm all sorry. Um, <coughs> this is just a question, well, comment based on that. Um, I can't find it now, but it says that um, tra the traffic was originally going to, why do I, why do, I do this? Five to ten, five to ten cars, what? I can't find it. Oh, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to Any it. accidents? Yeah, no. Um, here it is. It's on it's, uh, December 9th from um, the use of the Eastern Road access is expected to be limited to only five or ten vehicles per hour. If I lived in those apartments, I would go out that way rather than going all the way through and up to Route 1. So I can only assume that the only reason they wouldn't do that is because of the traffic load on Black Point Road, because they won't be able to get out to turn left to go to Route 1. That makes sense, right? Because I can't believe that only five or ten vehicles an hour would do that if it was something that was reasonable, because they're, they're right down there nestled against Black Point Road. I'm just making a point that at some point <coughs> the town has to get to discussing that we're going to have to have a signalized intersection there. Not today, not during the life of this development, but there's going to have to be a signalized intersection there. There's just no other way, of, there's no way of getting around it. Anyway, that's not today. Today, I'm glad we have the affordable housing explained to us. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little... <laughs> where are we with the... Um, Post office. Um, can I just make one comment with respect to uh, Mr. Beely's uh, uh, comment? Okay. We're actually providing six affordable housing units. We're getting credit for three. So we're actually providing six. Okay? You'd mentioned three. We're actually providing six, but we're going to be getting credit for three. 
I'm not sure if you knew that. Did you have you to do with the density <laughs> boat? The I don't want to know. <laughs> okay. well, we're providing we're providing six affordable housing units. Um, we're getting credit for three, but we're providing six. Um, just to just to clarify that. And Ms. Auglis, your question again was? Um, about the post office, it, one of the staff <coughs> comment was um, the post office did not meet some of the town's design standards, particularly related to the roof sign. Right. So we have a post office that we saw, we saw in this beautiful little town. Yeah. And we decided that we wanted to put it over there. Uh, we have a dog wash station <coughs> in the back of it. Okay. And um, the signage on it was quite big, and it doesn't meet the signed ordinance. So what we agreed to do was to work with the town code enforcement to make sure that the signage meets the town's code enforcement Perfect. standard. We also, with respect to just one other thing I may mention in case it's not brought up, we do have common space within the uh, project. We've got lounge space. We've got uh, teleconferencing rooms for people who do want to work at home, but at the same time want to meet somebody on site and not have to bring them up to their home. Uh, so we do have some of those other elements that are incorporated into this. We're trying to be very um, progressive, if you will. And I've got a list of uh, size of vehicles uh, to address um, some of the concerns that were, raised, were raised last time from small vehicles right on up through to suburbans and whatnot, if the board cares mm -hmm. to hear any of that. I think I saw it in here. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. This is my opportunity to say something nice. <laughs> I'm in love with Eastern Village. It's absolutely wonderful. I go through just often enough to say, oh, wow, look at that. Those little cottages, I just have to stop and giggle. They're hysterical. And where they come from, it's like a little mushroom that just popped up. It's not boring. It is absolutely not predictable. I have no clue what's going to be happening next, and every single one of them is a quality um, build. So I'm proud of it being in Scarborough, and thank you for doing all of that. I'm, I'm trying to cover over the fact that we're going to have to have an intersection light there. But anyway... I don't have any problems with what's in here. I really don't. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Robin? Uh, sure. Angela, I was just wondering if you could clarify. You said the original approval uh, with respect to the traffic and the traffic study. Something on the original approval was that the developer was to do some part of the traffic study or no? Um, well, there is a traffic study. Okay. Well, there was that one done for the original project. Right. Um, what I was referring to was what came out of that at that intersection and off sites, really, right? Oh. Off site improvements. And maybe Carrie can speak to this better than I, because I was, I haven't gone back to go through that just with conversations with Dan Bacon. But um, my understanding is that with the approval, there was discussions on what offset improvements needed to be done and part of that is that eastern trail crossing and the rapid flashing beacons what i was saying is the town went ahead of them okay and installed that and spent you know town, town money. funds yes okay but it was originally as part of the approval to be your responsibility no well <laughs> the answer is yes and no yes. as part of the original approval there was a, uh, a request that there be a crosswalk put down at the intersection of Black Point Road and Eastern Road at some point in time, and that myself, DOT, and the town would share in that expense. Mm -hmm. um, there was no date on when it was going to occur. We just all agreed to collaborate on it. Mm -hmm. um, the town decided to go ahead and implement the crosswalk design that they have now. Mm -hmm. We weighed in on it. Um, we didn't agree with some of the aspects of it, but we weighed, we weighed in on it. They went ahead and made some of the improvements. Some of the improvements were not done correctly by the contractor. We went up there and fixed those, um, and that's kind of where we're at now. Now there's an issue with collisions and whatnot, so the town has said, okay, we believe there's still a problem up there based on the crash data, we want you to collaborate with us again through the Transportation Committee and, as a dollar figure, contribute $7,500 towards that solution, whatever it may be. Great. And I've agreed to do that. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
super, and thanks for clarifying. Um, and I'd really like to thank uh, Portia Hirschman for being here and for providing a very insightful uh, email that's in front of all of us. Um, and, and in fact, um, I'd like to use my time to, to get some of these questions answered. Um, I also have been very concerned about the, the, the uh, large amount of hard surface draining into not only the storm pond but off-site. Are there no concerns about pollution from the number of parked cars which would get into the marsh? The answer that I've been told so far is that this, pr this uh, preliminary approval was given back in 2006, correct? And that, that With was updates by 2012. And that none of that approval or, or addressing any of these concerns were really part of that approval or that the, the um, pond itself was supposed to be the panacea for any off-site impacts. So I guess, Carrie, what would you, what, what's your sort of impression as to whether or not there needs to be anything else? Well, given the time that we have and that you probably don't want to stay to listen to the whole story, um, there used to be three ways that the water drained off the site and an abutter wanted to stop that water from coming across in two, three locations actually that had been going across the site for basically the last 10,000 years, if you Sorry, will. I'm going to interrupt. Do you believe that it's being mitigated? Do you believe that the on-site pollutants are being mitigated by the pond? I do. Uh, given, the, given the pond that design that we came up with, that we built, that um, as I understand it is state of the art, that cost um, well in excess of a half a million dollars to build. What's in there for treatment? What have we got for pollutant removal? Well, we go into a gravel bench in a wetland and from there the water flows out. Steve can tell you more about it than I can. I'm not obviously an engineer. But um, the wet water that pond, it's not an underdrain soil filter. It's a wet pond. It's an underdrain. So what kind of treatment you got, Steve? What it, kind of? It goes from treatment? a wet pond to a under to a to a gravel bench underdrain filter system. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm still not seeing any pollutant removal. It's got pollutant removal based on DEP's BMP standards for a wet pond. It's got a filter bench on it for its outlet control, so it's got a channel protection volume. And it's got the filter volume based on volumes of water on inch and a half of rainfall and four inches of so felt area. What mechanism in the pond is providing the pollutant removal of what the, the citizens are worried about? So it's got the proper depth so that all the water that goes into it, it's got the Does it have an oil water it does have an oil water separator to skim out the top? Well that's the captured oils? that's captured within the pond itself through that filter mechanism. The outlet has a filter on it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll look at the specs uh, myself. Um, is there no possible provision? Well, will final paving be required before occupancy permits are issued? I guess that's a question for staff. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'll sort of speak to the site proper. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of deal with... Um, subdivisions and site plans slightly mm -hmm. differently. So regarding the site proper, depending on the time of year, if they have a um, binder course down and it's mm -hmm. late in the year, we'll, um, we'll typically uh, require a performance guarantee before the final pavement goes down in the springtime. Um, okay. But uh, and then maybe Thank Angela you. can speak to sort of the overall sure. subdivision and well, I, I guess it's, just, it's very similar. I mean, we hold money, um, and as far as subdivision goes, they wouldn't need occupancy for the roadway section, so it would really go divert back to the site plan for this instance. But w the town does hold money, um, and we keep a retainage as it gets released, as things um, progress, so that we are you know, have some insurance policy. Carrie, what's the schedule for paving? If I may. What's the schedule for paving? Surface or binder? Uh, what's a finished paving product? Once the site is fully completed and all improvements are made. Which is when? Depends on when we get approval. Depends on when we get bank financing. If you get approval tonight, when's it going to be done? It's based on the market. I mean, you know, the market's pretty robust right now. We've got a lot of interest. So it's not a priority to do it in the spring? 
you do not ever want to surface pave your site until all your improvements are done. Okay, how about snow storage? Have you gotten, have you provided more snow storage? We've got plenty of snow storage on the site, yeah. On, um, and, on, on and off the site. But, but let, me just, let me just answer with respect to base and surface pavement. What you want to do is you want to get your base pavement down as soon as you can so you don't have erosion. But when you're working with heavy equipment, excavators, lulls, man lifts, all the various pieces of equipment, you don't want to do any surface pavement. Surface pavement literally is the last thing you do. So once you've got... Gary, I'm, I'm good. I was a consultant for DOT in the turn fight for 17 years. All right, no, let's, let's, let's not go I'd like, down No, I know, again. but I'd like to also understand when the site lighting, question, the site I, lighting I, will be planned. I, I know that is required. Site lighting, when will it go in? It, as, soon as, we, as, as soon as we develop the site. Okay. It, it, okay. I just, I just find it. I, I think it's, I have a lot of the same questions that this, this person does, and I, I think that it's just really important to get some straight answers. For not only for the planning board but, uh, because but I completely agree with what the I I respect that and I respect the public input but this was an email that we received today uh -huh. and I don't know how long the applicant had how, how many how much of an opportunity the applicant yeah. had to to read it um, I think it's important to make sure we address open items but I just don't know how productive it is to go through and yeah sort of a, a well, I, I think that I've brought up many of these these before, and I, I think it is important to have an ongoing working relationship and, and understand what the schedules are. So if there's any way that we could understand that more clearly, I would really appreciate it, that, not only for myself, but on behalf of your, your, um, your community. Mr. Chairman? Yes. We were approved for a certain amount of impervious area through DEP. Right now we're currently under that. It's hard for us to build a neighborhood like this, being what you see right here, as dense as it is without, I mean, I can't not pave areas in here. And even if they're unpaved, they're still considered as impervious to the DEP. Or, yeah, impervious to the DEP. So um, no, we're trying to build a quality project. I, and I understand, and, I, and I'm not trying to cut off any productive conversation, but I, and, uh, but I, and I don't think it's, Productive to sort of relitigate an approved plan. Um, I think we would all agree we want to make sure, and as I'm sure you do, that you pay due attention to the sort of constructive construction means and methods and sequencing and everything, and being sensitive to neighbors' issues. And I just I just want to try and put a put a period on that for right now. And and I think you get it. And um, it's just in the interest of everybody here, I don't want to go back into going through things in a what starts to seem like an adversarial way. So just by way of history, I've been developing the town for twenty five years. I don't think that there's anything that I've done in any project that's not been up to the standards of the town. I don't think anyone has suggested that. Thank you. Thank you. Robin, do you have anything else? Um I do, but I'll hold it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I, just a, a couple of observations. Um, when my husband and I moved here from Northern Virginia, we took a look at Eastern Village and we're, we're very impressed with it. Um, we didn't end up buying but there, but uh, it reminded me very much of the Reston development um, in, in Virginia, uh, which created very good neighborhoods, and that's what we saw going on there. Uh, it, it did not luckily remind us of where we moved next from in Virginia, which was into Loudoun County where the houses were being built at just an absolutely fantastic rate. And the county gained 100,000 people in the space of 10 years. I, and I appreciate the work that you're doing and the, the care that you're taking. And I'm very glad that you also talked about the community area that, that you were putting in those buildings, in, in the apartments, because that's, that's, a, that's important to give people flexibility, especially in small apartments, where they can find a different place to, to find some place to meet a neighbor or to find a place to work or conduct their business. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Rick? No, I think it looks good. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, if I could, the one last comment I do have sure. is, is regarding unsuitable soils, where unsuitable soils will be uh, taken off site, or whether or not they will be taken off site, where they will okay. go. Okay. Steve, do you want to address that? <coughs> the best of my understanding, uh, there should be limited amount of unsuitable soils within what we're doing here based on what we've done for grades and excavation and so <coughs> forth. Uh, there's a fair amount of other area that I would expect. Uh, when I say unsuitable soils, be soils that would be less suitable for putting a building on it or putting in a parking uh, space over it. So maybe some clay soils or silty clay soils, uh, stuff that's just not really suitable to build on it but could be used for open space landscaping areas. And there's a number of open space zones here that they still have yet to build out and mm. achieve what they're trying to do there. So I would fully expect that that's probably where they would go. Uh, on site. On They'd site. be kept on They'd site. They'd be kept on site. Thank you. Far cheaper. I would hope so. Okay. All set? Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm also a, a fan of this project, and, and uh, like everyone else, want, definitely want to see it succeed as it continues to grow and mature, if you will. Um, I do appreciate the additional information and sort of frames of references, frames of reference around uh, parking space width. I think that uh, uh, definitely is, is helpful to sort of give us some scale and, and sense of context there. And I, I think I think I'm fine with that. And I, I definitely get, as I think we all do, ultimately, that part of the idea here is that you know, part of this village feel is that you you want things to be narrower and you want to try and slow things down, uh, and that that's all part of it. Um, I'm also glad that we've that uh, we seem to have arrived at a at a good affordable housing approach, and I appreciate the input of the housing alliance on that. Um, look forward to hopefully seeing that be fully realized going forward. Um, on the traffic, um, as has been discussed and described, it's and this is often the case with traffic. Um, you know, the the the, uh, the sequencing and the cause and effect can be can be tricky to sort of pin down. And this is a case where the the applicant has been an active participant in trying to work towards some solutions here. And we never want to hold one applicant responsible for solving broader problems. Clearly, Oak Hill and Black Point Road have some bigger picture issues that are going to need to be addressed. Whether that whether new signalized, signalized intersections are part of that or whatever the case may be. Um, I know that, that um, the, the crosswalk there at Eastern Road, I've seen it myself, can cause some, some issues with driver behavior. I've seen some similar things at the, uh, the Pine Point Crossing, uh, Pine Point Road Crossing of the Eastern Trail, which I drive by multiple times each day. Um, so hopefully that can be um, tweaked and, and refined. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, I think we, you know, we, it, it's always, uh, it can be tricky with these phase developments um, where you have people who are living in an established neighborhood and they want things to just be finished and done and they don't want to be dealing with trucks coming in and out and um, it's hard to sort of manage and live up to expectations sometimes with timing in terms of when certain phases are going to be done and I think that applies in a general sense. It also applies when it comes to different improvements that go along with that. And so I, I think we generally understand that it's hard to, to say I'm going to do this at such and such a date when you're dealing with building out a residential neighborhood. That said, we fully expect, and, and I'm sure that you will, be um, continue to communicate on that and follow through on those, on those commitments. So. Um, without belaboring, belaboring things further, um, we do have a couple of, of uh, conditional approvals here, one for uh, subdivision amendment approval and the other for uh, the actual site plan approval. Um, I'll ask Jay to actually read those since we've done a little bit of wordsmithing here and he can probably read My his handwriting. My handwriting has gone, gone a muck even worse than, than normal. Can, so, and I've already done a lot of reading tonight, so I'm happy to outsource that to you. So what I'll do is just read conditions as draft conditions for board consideration. Um, so uh, in terms of the subdivision, which I think would be the first action the board would take, um, again, as I stated, this will be sort of two actions uh, anticipated by the board if you 
uh, see fit. First condition, again, on the subdivision would be the notes. The notes 11 and 12 on plan sheet C5A are to be revised in accordance with staff comments related to item 1, uh, sub item 2, and item 2, sub item 2. Prior to the start of phase 7, the applicant is to meet with staff to identify uh, that the requ uh, requisite amount of affordable housing units have been or will be provided proportional to the number of units that are approved for final development and construction. Prior to the start of phase 7, the applicant is to conduct a traffic analysis to confirm traffic volumes to determine if any changes from the original assumptions have occurred and if necessary revise their traffic permit with the DOT and the town. In condition number four, prior to the release of a building permit for any building on lot 118, that's the multifamily lot, the applicant is to dedicate $7,500 to the town to put towards safety improvements at the, inter at the intersection of Eastern Road and Black Point Road. Okay. That's, that's, that's just a, uh, oh. I, I don't make motions, so you can. I'm ready to adjourn. <laughs> you can certainly move the, I think, if, if someone were to see fit, a motion uh, with, with the conditions as read by staff would, would work. Of course, you can modify what I just read. I move to approve the subdivision, to grant subdivision approval to Valentine Development with the conditions as read by staff. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Yes. I just wanted to check with staff to see if they're in complete agreement with the with the uh, motion as provided. You mean in terms of conditions that they would yeah. be involved in yeah. yep. administering? Exactly. Yep. Okay. No, nope. I think we these conditions are going to be dealt with. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Do we have one abstention? Okay. Um, Thank you. If the board's so inclined, I could read draft conditions for a site plan. <laughs> All right. Please. Please do. All right. We are inclined. Uh, let's see. As for consideration, uh, condition one, prior to the start of construction, the applicant is to revise the post office structure to be compliant with the town standards. Final review and approval by planning department staff is required. Two. During construction, the final location of landscape features will be, be, will be determined based on field adjustments to avoid conflicts with utilities. Prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall provide the town engineer with the updated HydroCAD model for review and approval. Prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall provide the town engineer with information related to the impacts on the box culvert under Eastern Road for the 50 and 100 year storms. Prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall provide updated traffic calculation impact fee analysis in accordance with staff and peer review memos. The materials are to be reviewed and approved at the direction of the planning department staff. In accordance with planning staff memo, the site plan is to be revised to include the town's standard plan notes as well as a note related to snow removal. A number seven, a pre-construction meeting is required before start of construction. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, his and his site contractor, and utility company representatives if applicable. The pre-construction meeting may be scheduled in coordination with senior planner. And finally, eight, revised plans to identify uh, ADA access to building G. Thank you. And I move to approve the site plan of Valentine Development for Eastern Village with the conditions as read by staff. I think the applicant might have a question on the conditions. I just have one condition with respect to uh, the 1,500 square feet uh, being lowered. We have uh, lots within Eastern Village right now that are 750 square feet, and we have homes that are being occupied that are around 500 square feet. I know that we had talked about the 1,500 square foot standard being requested to be moved. That, that was part of the subdivision okay, approval. You've already got approval. Okay, if you want to bring sorry. it up, we can. No, but, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear it. I was writing as fast as I could. Thank you. I have one other motion to reconsider. Do we have a, do we have a second? We have a second. Uh, discussion. Discussion. Um, what happens if uh, the culvert or doesn't meet the 50 and 100 year standard? 
and or the HydroCAD isn't um, acceptable to the town engineer. Um, I guess what I'm looking for is not necessarily it, um, it has the capacity for the 1500 year storm event. Typically on a large culvert such as this, we want to see what adverse impacts could happen. We want to make sure it doesn't blow out. We want to make sure it's not taking the road out, you know what I mean, and, and seeing where that comes back through. It also kind of sends a benchmark for as like phase eight gets built out that we know what, what we're looking at and what we're expecting. Um, as far as the HydroCAD model goes, that's more of, um, again, supporting documentation for the narrative because I think the narrative, and, and Carrie, I think, had mentioned it tonight, is they talked about reducing impervious on the portions that have already been built because they're adding some impervious for this and knowing whether that was incorporated in the model or maybe the model was not modified and so we're actually viewing above and beyond. It's, it's seeing how that fits in and I think in the conversation goes, if we're at 30% developed or whatever is what has been mentioned, that this gives us the opportunity to, to keep track of that and so that we don't, we don't lose track of that and it doesn't get away from us as far as what impact it's having for the marsh and the off-site discharge. Does that make sense? Good. Any other discussion? All in favor? One opposed again? Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We still got a few items here. Hopefully, nothing too onerous. We have a staff report. Uh, just a reminder that there is a workshop on Wednesday here with uh, town council regarding the growth management ordinance, uh, long range planning committee, planning board, council. Uh, I can't remember all the other committees that were invited, but <laughs> hopefully we'll see a few of you there as well. Yeah. I regret that I'll be out of town, but I hope others can uh, participate. Isn't it tomorrow night? No, no it's, it's, it's been moved to Wednesday. The chair, okay. the chair is supposed to be there. It's it got moved again. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I don't have as much pull as I thought. Um, administrative amendment report. Yep, one item to report. Uh, six. Science Park Drive got an approval um, through the administrative process for, uh, boy, what would you call them, uh, sort of uh, cooler units uh, at the, uh, uh, on the exterior of their building. <laughs> Any planning board correspondence beyond the emails that were already referenced tonight? We had, again, several for three Eastern, East Grand Ave as well as the one for Eastern Village. Any other correspondence to report? No. Nope. Any planning board comments? I'd just like to, to uh, um, apologize that I was not meant to be adversarial. It was just time going short. Um, but a lot of the comments that were brought up in the audience I thought were important. And um, I, uh, this is my first dissent on the board. And we can all you know, challenge ideas, but I'm not necessarily challenging the people. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. And no one will ever hold uh, hold against you if you don't happen to. Thanks, because it's 11:30. <laughs> they all find ourselves in that spot once in a while. Any other comments? Do you have a um, nominating committee? I was going to talk to our fine secretary before the next meeting to come up with nominations for the next slate of officers. Nope. I will table a discussion at that point. Any other comments? All right. This is our last meeting of the year. Everyone enjoy the holidays and um, we'll see you next next month. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>